go. All right, cool. Here we go. What's up, y'all? It's your boy Chris here of 1980 Something Co. It's the 1980 podcast. Welcome, welcome. So today's guest is someone who I've come to know in this community fairly recently, but has already already come a long way in the short time that I've known him. Uh, I like to think that a big part of that is because of his big, positive, delightful personality. He is one of the co-creators of the Faded event that went down in Providence, Rhode Island earlier this year. Uh, he has a unique and crazy curation, which we will discuss today as well. I'm talking about Joe, a.k.a. Champagne Room with Sinatra. Joe, what's up, brother? Oh, shoot, we lost audio. <laughs> I can't hear you. Is that me or is that, can you hear me? Let's try this. I got a drink <laughs> in hand. I'm learning the Zoom thing, guys. I'm sorry. So don't fault me for it. Don't fault me for it. I haven't uh, Zoomed in like three years. It's all good, man. It's all good. Yeah. Uh, what's up, man? What you been up to? You've been pretty quiet. I haven't heard from you in a minute. It, like, have you stopped uh, or slowed down your posting on IG or is it just that damn IG algorithm? Uh, you know? I mean, I was going, when I first started doing it, like, well, started my page, I guess. I've been doing it forever. But when I first started doing my page, Chris, it was like, sure today, sure today, sure today. And then, uh, you know, I slowly started running out of inventory for sure. Like, and I guess I had to just work harder to get more, you know. So the quality's gotten better, but I think the, the quantity is diminished for sure, you know. But, no, I'm, I mean, you'll see stuff from me at least, hopefully at least twice a week. Two to three yeah, times well, a week. I, but. I see stuff, stuff pop up, but yeah. So why has uh, – is it because when I first – because you're pretty new to the community. At least that's when I when I first met you was like 2021. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I met you through the Instagram live community. So is it that uh, you were selling mostly at that time and you're not selling anymore? Why has the quantity gone down? I was just, I mean, first of all, I started it as a collector for sure, for sure. Like it, it during the even before the pandemic for like probably four years, I just collected shirts, shirt, shirt, shirt. And I didn't even really think to sell them. They were just kind of like stacking up. Don't mind that. That's a, uh, I'm actually at my restaurant right now, guys, setting up. That's kind of why I've gone radio silent too, but we'll, I'll get there. But was stacking up, stacking up stuff, Chris. And then, um, I looked in my closet at one point and I had like 300 shirts, 350 shirts, um, you know, some grails, some, you know, mids, whatever you got, whatever people call them. Uh, and then I just decided I had to get rid of them. I started doing like eBay or whatever. And uh, the first thing I stumbled on was, was Jeremy's live. That was like the first, like in the community thing. I don't even know how I found it. I really don't. I, it might have been like a post of a post or something. Yeah. Um, and uh, I remember I was so nervous, dude. Like your first, I don't know, like how were you on your first live, Chris? I mean, yeah, I think everybody gets nervous. Even me, so many lives that I've hosted, when I'm a guest on somebody else's live, I'm super nervous. So anybody that comes with I mean. that energy, I'm like, yo, you're a G. But then you find out later that you're nervous because you're one of those people that I remember you – would always send me a request. When, when when I saw that first request, after that, every day I got a request whenever I went live from uh, Champagne Room with Sinatra. Well, I'll make you laugh. There was there was a point where, like, no one knew my page or knew who I was. So, like, dude, I would literally wake up. Like, you, you'd you usually go on, what, like, 9 a.m. your time? So it'd be like, yeah, like, noon. But, like, dude. And this was dude, what, this like, was like, this was 2021, right? Yeah, well, yeah like, I'd say late 20. Early 2021, I would say. Yeah, early 2020. But so I would like, early yeah. 2021, you had, you know, 300 T's that you had just collected just from you collecting. Dude, just sitting there, dude. Just, and then you yeah, probably were seeing just... lives and you were like, let me sell some of this shit. Is that how it happened? Yeah. And yeah, when I first, even before I went on yours, I would I went on Jeremy's and uh, I actually did one with Barry from Afro Vintage. And I would get rid of like five, 10 shirts at a time. Boom, 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 gone, gone. Starting everything at a dollar because at that point, you know, you know how it was back before the pandemic. You could find stuff for cheap or you, you know, I just had to get rid of it. I didn't really care what the fuck it, you know, it went for. It could have went for 30 bucks. It could have went for $400. So I was just like, I didn't really know anything about the market or the value of them. Mm -hmm. So I would just like throw them up and people be like, oh, dude, that's dope. That shirt's dope. That shirt's dope. And I was like, I mean, I, I appreciated it, but I didn't know anything like about the business at all. 
So uh, I would just, they just started whittling away and whittling away. And the funny part about your life is I knew how popular, the at this point, the flea, the flea was popular. Like, homies were like, there was like a waiting list or some shit to get on it, dude. I remember. Yeah, like, we had a, being, a raffle, and yeah, there was a waiting list to be a vendor on. For, yeah. Which was rad. I was like, I was stoked for, for you, too. Like, I didn't even know you from a hole in the wall, but I was stoked that, uh, you know, this – something I love gain this type of popularity where homies are like in line to sell, sell shit. So, um, I remember like you were booked out for like a month or, or, or so. And I'm like, fuck, like I want to chop it up with this dude. I want to find a way to do it. So I used to wake up, wake up cause I was partying a lot at this time. It was still like pandemic. I'd be like rolling out of bed at like 11 30 or whatever and I'd be like, oh shit Chris is live in you know 20 minutes I would like try to fucking slap some water on my face and I would literally try to be the first dude that hit the request button you know what I mean like Word. as soon as that 12 o'clock hit I would boom you know and a lot of I was fortunate I think like three out of the four t- first times I did it I got on so I was like I'm just gonna keep trying this you know so I did that for a while, and then yeah, I remember after this. Request, like I said, once the age of Champagne Room with Sinatra started, it just went on. And it went on to do the Faded event, and it, you were on Coffee with Dave and the Faded event, and uh, you know we'll get into all that right now. But yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I, how do you think I wanted you got to get so it. involved in the community? What what was it? You think? I think it was just like Dude, the personality. Everyone was fucking cool. I, that's how, I mean, that's pretty much how I, I got into it, which was awesome. Everyone was, like, friendly, and, you know, I come from a good scene. I was doing, I was in music scene and stuff, and great people in that, but, like, there was no, like, air of, like, uh, you know, no air of pretentiousness with this scene, dude. Everyone was pretty, like, whether you got into it yesterday or you got into it 15, 20 years ago, everyone was pretty nice to me. Yeah. So I was, like... Dude, these people, these are, it was like, almost like you found like 300 clones of yourself, like someone that was like a a reflection of, you know what I mean? (laughs) Like everyone wanted to have fun, smile, you know. um, And you too, man, you have a way of like making someone feel like they're your friend automatically. Like one thing about you, whenever I would accept your request to come into the live is uh, first of all, you're already in the middle of a word when you come on the screen. So like for other people, when I invite them onto the live, they pop up and they're like, hey, what's up? You know, once we see them and then they talk. But you, it's yeah. like, as soon as the screen would pop up, you would be in the middle of a word. It'd be like, uh, waiting for it to, you know, it's it's about to load up. And then when it loads up, it's like, hey, what's up, Chris? How you doing? <laughs> you were, I was like, when did you start, uh, uh, you know, greeting me? Was that like, well, I, were you even hopping on live? Were you already talking to me through the screen? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was lucky. To, oh, yeah, dude. I was, well, the thing would always like delay. So maybe you caught me like I thought it was on so early or whatever. But I uh, I was fortunate enough to it. I I spent my whole life, Chris, in hospitality. Yeah. Um, so, and I generally like people. Like, you know, a lot of hospitality people, I fucking hate people. And I'm like, dude, why are you here? Like, if you hate people, why, why are you doing this? You know, so, um, and I and liking people and wanting to be like uh, part of this whatever scene, it, it just seemed like an easy trend. It was a super easy transition. Like what you do well, I think, and have continued to do well is make pe- people feel comfortable. Like you do, you have kids on there that are like 19 years old, don't know shit about vintage, but just want to be part of it. You know, it's almost like a mute, like it's like music. I say all the time, like that scene, it's like, these kids just want to be part of it. So you make them feel like, you know, you, you go through their pieces, make them feel important, even if it's only for, you know, you're running something in an open live or whatever. You make these kids feel good. And I felt that way, you know, when I was on with you. I didn't feel like you were like, oh, who's this fucking random kid with the long Instagram name? You know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? That name, where did that name come from? Champagne Room with Sinatra. Um... Was it, it's kind of like a two, it's kind of a twofold thing. I I just thought of it to be honest. It was like it's a twofold thing. So I'm 100 percent Italian descent. So like um, when I was a kid, like grandma's always got you know Sinatra playing at, on Christmas, you know, in the background or whatever. So um, I kind of wanted something that paid homage to that, but I also wanted something that sounded fun and that had nothing to do with vintage. Like it could go anywhere. You know what I mean? I could be 
uh, a record label or I could be, you know, selling old dirty t-shirts, you know, it, you know, anywhere in between, you know, similar to your name. I mean, when you hear 1980 something, it doesn't have thrift or vintage and not saying that's a bad thing. Cause a lot of times that gives recognition to what you're doing, but it doesn't, you don't like get pigeonholed. You know what I mean? Anywhere you're, you can be anything you want to be. I so. did in the beginning though. People were like, why are you, you need to change your name to 2000 something code cool, whenever I'd sell something that wasn't from the eighties. But yeah. the 1980 something code didn't come from what I sell. It came from the year that I was the year that I come from. You know, I'm from the eighties. I know you born in what 88? 86. 86? Yeah. Damn, Chris. You got a little gray in the I, now I'm, I'm seeing ah, the <laughs> <laughs> No, I know. I yeah, that well, that's what I figured when I when I read your name too. And it's like if you want to be good in the business, you can't just sell 80 shirts, dude. You know what I mean? Those aren't the I only know, things. I, I say this a lot. Like, I, I wanted to go with that name because I wanted that to be the first thing that we addressed. Like, yeah, I'm from the 80s. Because I yeah. felt like uh, when I started doing thrifting, even as a hobby before I started doing it full time, I just felt like it was like a younger person's thing to do. Uh, I felt like I was like, yeah. out of it from the beginning. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to address that right away with my name and just... It is what it is. Get over it now. Now look at my team. I mean, I would have been even in the same. When, like, I remember we talked on Coffee Jays about, like, the, the Rose Bowl days of you getting after it super early. How old would you have been at that at that time? Uh, when I first started, you mean? Yeah, well, when you, you know, you told me you, at one point you were hitting the ground running, like, er, not Rose Bowl, oh, yeah. sorry, early at the Melrose Flea, like, you know, 3 a.m. Like, was that, were you, like, on your later 20s or was that like yeah so like what's getting the, the ground right? running era was when i had decided to do this full time so i was 2016 so that was like six years yeah. so i had just turned so what you're saying is yeah to you you felt like an old man but dude to be honest though that's like the peak of when you should be hustling you know people fuck off in their 20s all dude my 20s I, is I, like I think because work. at the time a lot of my friends already had like established like corporate like grown person adulty jobs and I was like, oh, I'm going to go thrifting. You know, so I think that's what kind of made me feel like. Yeah, like, that's you're wearing, like, suits to work. And you're like, yeah, you know, I'm sitting in line with a couple of old Haitian ladies at fucking, you know, you know it's 6 a.m. But you know, no, I've been like that, though. Of, of my group of friends, I'm the last one to mature. I've always been the goofiest one. Always said Same. the most inappropriate Always been the one that's just like, yo, when are you gonna calm down? You know, it's like, bro, you gotta. But it's also I like having a good time. It. I love silly, stupid jokes. Those are the best. That's why, yeah, that's all I spit on Virtual Fleet is just dad jokes. I love that shit. Well, I mean, I think I think people fell in love initially too with the Virtual Fleet because you were being yourself, and I think encouraged other people uh, to want to be themselves. You know, there's no nothing worse than like some fucking dude getting up there way too serious just makes you feel stuffy, you know? And I think it breathed life into um, what people perceived as the business as something like old hat, like, and gated. You kind of, people like you, Jeremy, uh, some of these cats opened the door up to that and made it more accessible for younger kids to be like, yo, I, I want to be a part. As long as you want to put your fucking, you know, your nose to the grind and do it, you can be part of it too, which I thought was, I think that's what drew me too to the, the scene. Oh yeah. And it's like you said. I think I, I was yeah. at one point very much like, oh yeah, we got to keep it a secret. Not because I was like gatekeeping, but because I know other people your money off this and I don't, I didn't want to be the guy that's like giving out. Cause you see that a lot where people are just giving out secrets kind of like for clout, like here's how to become an Instagram seller type situation. I will tell you, I agree with you. It's the idea of people need to understand, like you can divulge a little to make people feel included, but also realize it's your business. You know what I mean? Like you don't want, you don't want to get it too saturated where the business starts suffering and you got two kids to feed. You know what I mean? Like, and a lot of people do. Yeah, but Virtual Flea made me realize that it is cool to share that information, that you can help yeah, others. Yeah, that, uh, yeah. You know, we can all be, we could all do this together actually you know so it was a cool little like switch of not that i was like very gatekeepy before uh i kind of just roll with the punches but uh yeah i would just keep a couple some things to myself now i'm more of like um 
let's help people because everybody everybody needs I feel like everybody needs help this day and age you know it's like the world's so yeah. crazy well it's cool I try to keep my ears open too like I you know the people who did this have been doing this for much longer than I am I just keep my mouth shut and listen to what they have to say like Sam being one of them even Ryan dude who's been in it way longer than me but like I was fortunate too to be around geographically because they're all like Boston or Providence people um, I was geographically around them so I could drive to Providence or even Ryan at one point was living like, you know, still lives like 15 minutes away from me. So, yeah. and I, I'd, I'd watch and see them like in a buy or whatever, you know, when you guys buy, you buy a haul or you buy specific items, I'd watch and, and pay attention and know the proper etiquette. Like, like if some dude's like sifting through stuff, you don't run over and bowl them over. You, you know, he did the deal first. He was there first. It's up to you to either him to pass and you to swoop or, you know, you to let it go. But, yeah, you know what I mean? I think a lot of kids now are like, they're seeing money in it and they're like trying to rush to the front. It's like, you know, what's crazy. Yeah. Since now that. there's more people in it and there's like more respect in the game, like what you just described. But before when there was less people in it, it was way more crazy. Like there was fights at Rose Bowl, like just, it was nutty. So it's kind of crazy. Really? Oh, okay. Uh, you got any good? Dude, I'm sure you saw plenty of that shit. Anything? Anything to note, dude? I'd, I love the uh, the Rose Bowl fight. <laughs> I mean, nothing story. crazy. No, there was no punches being thrown, but there was just a lot but of like things. yanking a thing or yeah. something, like a like of tug of wars and shit. Yeah, yeah a lot no, of silly little bickering like that. I mean, I can see it from what I like. The part that sucks for me is I think I miss that. Like people talk about Rose Bowl mystically, like back, you know. What was that like? Probably like seven, five. It's like right when you were getting into it, where like oh, you get there at three thirty in the morning. Yeah, there, there's um, there's sellers that tell me about Rose Bowl in the nineties. Heard about Rose Bowl in the nineties? Is that even more epic? Dude, crazy. So I don't even think it was about teacher. It was about whatever they were selling then. It was it was the different kind of the trend that was going on at that time. But I mean, they were pulling out like tens of thousands of dollars every Rose Bowl. There's a legend of this one seller who walked away with a hundred k. In one day. One day. Think about just one like, day. like multiple sellers, like Mexican dudes, just like clearing out storage units or whatever they, however they find their stuff, selling at Rolls Bowl and making so much money that they're buying houses. Like they have, they own like five houses, six. Oh, dude, that's there's like, one seller that's, that's fucking like, down pimp. Yeah, there's one Whoa. seller that's like, dude, it used to be so crazy. I own 11 houses. I own 11 houses all from how it used to be like Rose Bowl, I'd walk away with like 20, 30 G's every Rose Bowl. That's in that, that is the real days of Rose Bowl. But I've been getting on this new thing too, where like, I don't think that that's unattainable again. I just think it, you have to work twice as like, you know, 10 times as hard to get it, you know, like, dude, think about the amount know, of 20 K in one day. That's 20, 30 K every Rose Bowl. Dude, I'm pretty sure. Um, one, I think one seller at Faded did close to that, to be honest with you. It was a it was 20, like 20, 20. It was, you know. Uh, yeah, was it a true, like a true vintage type seller? Yeah, uh, like one of those that. homies. But but still, you know, I'm sure some of my t shirt guys did crit. I call them t shirt. I don't know why I call them fucking t shirt guys. People sell shit other than that. But you know what? I, like a, a newer seller selling like 90s stuff or whatever. They were doing killer numbers. I, you know, I think. Uh, there's meat on the bone. It's just you gotta you gotta look harder, I guess. Are you finding that being your journey right now? Like getting back into? I'm stoked actually. You got back into selling too. Um, yeah, when I saw um, that. I thought that was awesome. Yeah, it's it's definitely different. I'd say uh, I'm having a lot of fun going back out and finding stuff. But uh, there's a different like in, the, the the vintage community has grown, and now they're not just looking for t-shirts. There's like a bunch of uh, a lot of women's clothes now when I go to the, when I used to go to the flea was just tea, teas galore. Everybody had teas, but I think that because there now there's so many sellers, there's not enough teas to go around. So everybody has their rack with teas, but they've adapted. The sellers also have other things besides teas. Like before it was weird. It was like not common to have a pants rack in your stand. Every stand has yeah. pants rack, women's clothes in there. Uh, they just have a nice mix now. And I think that's great for the sellers because they have more things to choose from to make money off of. You know, I remember when I had my stand like that, it was all T-shirts. Exactly. 
But I think the goal, <clears throat> we're, I guess you're a reseller, right? That is that the word we're using? Reseller or curator or whatever. But yeah, like you're saying, Chris, there's no, if you know my, this is my philosophy on everything. I buy something and actually Larry uh, from Heller's Cafe, I heard a podcast of him. I haven't unfortunately had the opportunity to meet him. He's a great guy, but uh, he was on Drew's podcast. So he goes, if I knew I could get what I put into it or more, I'll buy it. And I fucking live at this point, my entire life, like, you know what I mean? Like my entire life like that. Cause think about it. When in life can you buy something off a rack and it doesn't depepreciate the next day? Like you buy Dior, an, even a Dior t-shirt, mm-hmm. it's worth, it's like a car. It's worth 30% less once you fucking take it off the lot, you know? So, you know, we're really fortunate that this people have started like attaching themselves to, I don't care if it's sustainability or what the fuck it is, but they want to they want to invest their money in this stuff, which is like crazy. You know, to me, it's amazing. Uh, yeah. Going back. So your 300 T's, you had 300 T's in 2021. You start seeing these lives start hopping out. What are those 300 T's consist of? What T's did, what do you curate? What do you collect? Anyway. All right. So, my, the, the whole idea about my curation, like, obviously, I have a lot of hardcore tees. Everyone sees that or whatever, um, because I kind of grew up listening to that music and being in the – I'm from Boston, so the hardcore scene in Boston now is, you know, slow, but at one point it was like – it was New York, L.A., Boston were like the, the hardcore meccas of the United States. But what I would always do, Chris, I would look at a T-shirt and say, would this look good on a human being? You know what I mean? Is it like slime green with all that? You know what I mean? Like, if that's the case, I probably wouldn't buy it. If I thought, like, would I wear it and feel comfortable wearing this? That was my buy. I didn't really, I didn't know the value enough to be like, I always, too, though, look look for stuff that's, like, socially significant for the time. Like, people will be like, oh, I have this really cool Metallica 2004 shirt, Justice for All shirt. I'd be like, that's dope. But the record came out in the 80s. So, like, I'm really more concerned with the print from that time because that's to me, holds social significance and, you know, obviously it looks cool, too. But um, those were, like, my things. Like, I, I, I was doing a lot of 80s shirts. Like, at one point, you know the Hanes 100% cotton tag? Like from the 89, 90, whatever. Yeah. You know that tag. I was collecting just shirts with that tag on it. At one point, I had like 50, 60 shirts with that tag on it. Um, and what got you into so that? Like, so you're, you're buying uh, – you just wanted them to be from that time. Yeah. This is actually a cool story. What got me into vintage – it's funny. Well, it came from the circle. They're just like, why don't you just go buy that at the store right now? It's available there if you're a fan of the band. What is it about us that we have to have the tea from that time? Well, I mean, I know you, you have a lot of hip hop and rap teas. It's, I think it's the social significance behind it. Like, Wu-T- I love the idea of owning a rap tea when Wu-Tang was playing. Like, that's dated from when they were playing. You know what I mean? So it's like, you almost feel like you were at the, the gig, even though, you know, at that point, some of these kids were like, weren't even born yet. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know? But, like, for me, that's, like, that's the important part of vintage. And I think that's where some of these really old heads, that's what they look for. That's, like, their bread and butter. Like, the military guys, like, you know, a Type 1 jacket from the 90s is dope. But a Type 1 jacket from World War II, you know, World War II is way doper. You know, it's like a, it's but, it's the feeling of touching some that's from that time. There's some kind of magic there, right? Tell the truth. You know, Chris, you pick up a T-shirt from, you know, you pick up an OG rap tee that was sold sold either outside the gig or at the gig, or you pick up even. I know you've been to Rose Bowl a million times. You pick up some old military pants from fucking 1940. There's like a energy that comes from it. I don't. I don't know what it, I can't explain it, but you know, it's different than pulling it off the fucking H&M rack. Yeah. And what do you, you know, got on body the today? Same. What's on body today? Right now, uh, this is actually, um, this is a gang green party machine shirt, bootleg from uh, 89. It's got like a cut tag. Gang green was like a hardcore band and 
Boston. I own a couple of different Boston name, you know, keepsakes. So I just got the shirt back from a homie in uh in England, which I'll tell that that story later. It's pretty cool. So you sold that tea and you bought it back, dude. You know what's sad? I, a lot of teas that I've either traded or sold to people, I'm now getting back because I realized how much I like while well, they fit me or how much I miss them, you know, and I might sell them again. I'm not saying that it's not, it's going to stay in my possession forever, but um, I also look to when, another thing talking about what I look for is how the shirt drapes and also how it um, oh, yeah. feels fit on body in terms important. of texture. Yeah. Fit is super important for me too. It's super important, Chris, <laughs> you know, for a fact, if you, sometimes you're like, I want the shirt. I've wanted the shirt for so long. I wanted it. And then you get it. And it, maybe it's dead stock or maybe you like dead stock and it's faded and you're just like, Fuck, this isn't, I'm not going to wear this. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I'm going to have to pass it on. I'm not going to wear it. I've been disappointed plenty of times. Um, but I'll go back because you wanted to know how I got into vintage. It's funny because I ended up becoming friends with Rich from Metropolis. But Metropolis, I tell a story. Metropolis is kind of the reason why I got into vintage. I walked into that store five years ago, five or six years ago now. Um, I was just in New York and I Googled, I was starting to get into vintage. I Googled, you know, old, you know, rock t-shirts cause I always wear rock t-shirts. So that they were at their old location at this point, not on the broad, not on Broadway. So I walked into the store and have you been there before? I have not. I have not been to New York. Never been. Uh, I mean, I, 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 next time you're at New York in New York or when you're in New York, dude, we'll meet up, we'll go and, and uh, I'll have, the archive is the gnarliest part. I'll get to that too, for because we were there for faded. But uh, so I walk into the Metropolis and it fucking hits you, dude. Literally, it's like every square inch of that store is a t-shirt. Besides, like Rich should be getting to the point where he's gluing him to the fucking ceiling because that's the only part. Like looking up, that's the only thing in the whole place that isn't a t-shirt or <laughs> that's a pair of vintage right there. Like because I was trying to like for the layman who doesn't care who still is not getting it like why what is because why do we love these seeds why do we pay so much for them why are they so sought after one of the reasons is because we want to have something from the time when that artist or whatever the subject oh, yeah. of the shirt is was when it you know that shirt was made in there in that time but i think to a layman still it's just like okay but why why not why for a t-shirt like i understand if you get a guitar pick or like something that would be stored in a museum but to us, the T-shirts are a museum piece. And to give more perspective on it, when you walk into a store full of shirts like this and you're seeing all these different designs and uh, a lot of times the artwork is of the time, like that kind of artwork oh, you yeah. don't see it anymore. Nowadays, the artwork, because we're so advanced with uh, computer graphics, we have these really intricate graphics, different colors, and it's just not the same as uh, the artwork that was used back when that band, say 90s, 80s, was was thriving so it's it's when you're placed in a store like metropolis it's all in front of you you're seeing all the different designs all the different wares fades that you then see you know what i can't go back to a shopping mall metallic the saddest store. part is it's, it's the truth i can't you know you know how it is chris you do this too you can't justify it like name the last time you walked in the fucking h&m yeah I, i'm what? sure it's been a while what is it about you, know? you have the same shirt, right? Say, let's go to Metallica again, sold at H&M, and then there's a vintage version. Why is it that the H&M one, uh, you can't, like, I'll, I'll wear a vintage Metallica shirt, holes, beautiful fade to it, nice aesthetic to it. I'll, I'll wear that on a date, I, but if I wore the H&M one on a date, it's like a cheap shirt. Why? Yeah. That, that is something that makes sense to us. It doesn't make sense to someone who doesn't wear tees. Dude, the, the countless amounts of times I think of this a day is like, it's like every 40 seconds. I'm like, you know, homies think about sex every seven seconds. I think about vintage t-shirts every 40, you know, you know but like. Um, Adidas, all day I dream about shirts. That's a, that's it. I, dude, I, I think about this all the time too. And I just think it's the weight of it. You know, it's the idea, like not weight, like physical weight. I mean, like the weight of the shirt, like, you know, like think of metallic a metallica pusshead shirt like done by pusshead mm -hmm. this is when pusshead was still not an established artist doing fucking supreme collabs and shit this is pusshead literally like submitting 
to like Brockham or whatever he was submitting to. There was more like life in it too. And the, it's a lot of stuff, dude. It's the blanks, like the blanks, hundred percent cotton and American made blanks are be- are just a beautiful shirt. They fade well, they hold up well. Um, nothing's where you, does this happen to you? It's happened to me a million times. Like you get it like an H and M shirt. I hate blast the H and M Zara blast them on. Fuck, but you get one of those shirts, you wash it and then it curls up on the bottom or it like, you know, curls up on the sleeve and the shirt's dead. It's like, I'm never going to wear this again. One wash. You got again. little lint balls all. Oh yeah. I hate that. Yeah. And speaking of uh, H&M and all that stuff, uh, that is fast fashion guys. Somebody get, uh, dropped some hate on a post that I did this week where I'm wearing like a modern boot from someone. Modern boots just get way too much hate. People call them fast fashion. Do you guys even know what fast fashion is? Do you know how much clothes has to be made for people to consider it fast fashion? The modern boots that you know, people in the community are making where they make like 100 prints, probably max or average, that's not fast fashion. That's just a dude getting out his creativity trying to sell some T-shirts. I know the fat the, the boots were getting hate for a long time, but also you don't you people gotta realize, dude, like how many new band t shirts for tours are printed? You know, and those ones are printed, they print ten thousand of those. Yeah, I mean I love Kanye. Um and but you know that motherfucker prints two thousand shirts for for his tour. Like if a dude's doing a, a limited run of a hundred, and if you guys really understand printing, here's, here's like I question. Print- here, quick question before are you on you is supreme considered fast fashion to you because they print That's a lot of shit, I mean, dude, but none of their shit ends yeah. up at landfills you know what i mean pretty much none of their shit ends up at landfills or thrifts because people collect it so is it if a lot of stuff is printed uh that's what people say is fast fashion but if all of it is kept and adored is it still fast fashion Dude, Supreme's like the fucking Green Day of of uh, of clothing. Like they, like what I'm saying is they were like they were a super dope, cool skate brand that was well respected in underground for so many years, and then people caught on to the fact they were doing fucking awesome stuff. So like people be like, "You sold out, dude! Everyone's wearing Supreme." It's like, yeah, everyone's wearing Supreme because it's fucking dope. Like you know what I mean? Because they do cool collabs. Because yeah. they spend the time like. I hate the idea, too, of, you know, and I've done this before, so I'll shoot myself in the foot, but I'll be like, fuck Nirvana t-shirts, dude. Everybody's wearing Nirvana t-shirts. Like, yeah, because they're fucking awesome. Because the incesticide, the black incesticide shirt is sick. It looks amazing. Like, I want to own it, and I'm pissed that it's so expensive, you know? But, yeah, no, Supreme. I don't think Supreme's fast fashion. I think that they've put in their time and effort and i know they got i think they got bought out or something or whatever but yeah that's important to stay right there you know they've paid their dues they've done what they had to do to be to be a brand that is adored the way that it is adored. exactly I, i'll 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 parallel it to uh i'm a huge tattoo guy chris i'll parallel it to uh ed hardy so ed hardy the clothing line that we all know that's like now becoming vintage as funny as that sounds but um all those designs were done by a guy named Don Ed Hardy, who is literally the only reason why tattooing is as popular as it is in America. So this dude had been putting in his work and effort for a long time. And then he gets picked up and doesn't have any say in this. They literally just were like, we want to buy your designs and your name period. And um, he's getting notoriety and and more fit and continuing to get more famous for it. Like I have no problem with that dude. You know what I mean? When, when you're a brand for 30 years and finally, after 30 years of hard work, you get noticed and you're getting and you're making money. Anyone would do it. You do it. I do it. You know, people will say that about anybody like, oh, well, you know, you're selling out now. It's like, yeah. like when we worked with Bid Stitch at first, people were like, oh, you know, you were I'm like, first of all, I like those guys. And second of all, I'm just happy someone gives a shit about what we're doing. <laughs> you know, like. I put in five, you know, I put in so many hours on the internet, Chris. We did, at one point, it was almost a full calendar year, five days a week, two hours a day. Like, that's like Good Morning America shit. You know what I mean? Like, I I can't believe I run out of stuff to say. Yeah, that's a topic right there that is touchy for some people, you know, because it's just like they want 
I feel like people sometimes they, they, they classify you in their heads as something. And then if you try to grow from that, which we're, we're all supposed to be growing, you know what I'm saying? Um, you no longer fit in their box and they don't like that. You know, they're, they're, they want you to stay within the box that they had classified you as. If you grow out of it, if, if you go, if you go under what they classified you as, that's fine. But if you grow out of it, they don't like that, you know, but, but isn't uh, to me, Chris, isn't the idea well, just being my human? word to anybody who is in that situation and you're growing and you know maybe your fan base, your customer base, or whoever it is, yeah. uh, it, you're starting to sense that they're not liking that. You have to remember that it's important for you to be true to you and rem remember your intent. Remember that you're not Period. doing something to be uh, to piss anybody off, but just know that in your growth, that's going to happen no matter what. Uh, we on the was it last episode i think i forgot what episode it was but jay kwan was like uh he's like chris he says it on the in the, in the podcast he's like chris you know you have haters right and it, it took me back because i was like what like why would i have haters I remember if you don't you're not successful chris, but chris. He knows, he's like it's just a thing so it changed my perspective and it's given me a little bit more peace because anytime any type of negative comment or anything think about how uh uh how detrimental that is to, for just one comment to ruin yeah. my day. That's where I was. I was like, what did I do to piss this guy off? What could I have done? Like, am I yeah, but, fucking up? But then I realized but, some people are just going to hate just to hate. And, I, and that's changed my perspective. Yeah. When, when you know you're just going to have haters no matter what, it's like it, it allows me to just get back to work and do what I'm doing. No, just know why I'm doing it and not be affected by people who are going to come at you regardless of how good you do it. I agree. I mean, I got a big mouth. I'm sure plenty of people don't can't stand me, but it's the idea of I got into this as another you way. You got a lot of haters, bro. Like for you to come in and then already on coffee with Jay's got your fade. Oh, it's like, who the fuck is this guy? Why yeah. is he doing it? <laughs> yeah, but people know though when they meet me that I'm I'm a very dude. I'm like I have the smallest head. I have a huge geographic head, but the smallest head for like uh, someone who. I guess, you know, is in this thing or whatever, dude. I don't, I treat every human being I meet the same exact way. But it's the idea, Chris, is, I mean, you, you put in your work. So, and if people can't see that, you know, like, I'll be honest, dude. Like, when I saw the TikToks and shit at first, I'm like, dude, what the fuck's Chris doing? But then I realized, like, <laughs> he was probably always this funny and goofy. Like, it's not, you know what I mean? It's just, he's just finally feeling comfortable, I guess, enough to get out of his shell and do it, you know? And I, I, I really didn't think that it was, like, contrived or – same with Drew. Drew's a funny dude. Heifetz, like, he – people hate, hate on him, like, oh, he's goofing around, uh, he's so goofy. It's like, dude, he likes the Joker. Like, who yeah, cares? Yeah, the you know, pay attention. Is like, dude, just have fun. Like, take a joke. It's just a joke. You know, you guys want me to be – or, you know, people want you to, like I said, be a certain thing. It's like – I'm going to do what I got to do regardless, you know, but the TikTok thing and all the reels and stuff that I make that came about because that's kind of just all that Instagram wants to see now. Business. It's business. It's kind of crazy business. how it naturally happened because one day I was just watching a, like a, a bunch of reels. I got st stuck in a hole, just going down. Mm. Oh, I do that all the time. It's the worst. My girlfriend hates it. She wants to kill me. After. Yeah. I was up to like 3 a.m. <laughs> just watching reels. This was when I first, this was before I started doing any reels or TikTok. And I'm just going down and I'm like, dude, these are funny. I was like, look how funny people. I didn't even know people were this funny. Like human beings are. It's an expression in its own way. You know, yeah, it's I was like, I didn't of... there was this many funny people. And then next thing you know, I'm getting inspired. And I'm like, oh, I could do this one about. Yeah. Or I could do it about teas. And I could read, do we do this one as this. And that's kind of how it started. This was before they were like, oh, yeah, reels are going to be the only thing that, or that is going to take over. So I started yeah. doing reels just out of to be fun you know, to be funny or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. Now you have to do them. And uh, dude, it, it, it was pretty maddening at first. Cause I was like, man, I remember when I used to just take a picture of a t-shirt on the floor and get a thousand get likes. A thousand and likes. So, and yeah, now I have exactly. to do all kind of create. I got to become Steven Spielberg editing this, this reel. But you know, uh, I was really annoyed when I had to make those reels, but now uh, I'm kind of thankful. Cause I feel like I'm getting my real game down hard guys. Go comment on all my reels and let me know what do you think about because everyone takes a lot of like 
effort. I'm, I'm even editing them outside of Instagram. That's how obsessed I am now. I believe it. Oh, yeah. I have a separate yeah. app where I do all my crazy ass edits and then I put it up to IG. <laughs> I mean, people, people need to realize, I mean, they do realize there's plenty of people that are content creators, but when you're a content creator, your job is to fucking create content. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter if it's a t-shirt on the floor or it's a reel. Instagram, in order, has unfortunately said, if you want to stay popular or if you want people to see your shit, you better keep fucking doing stuff, you know? And that's, I'm at a disadvantage though too, Chris, because I'm, I'm like such in my head. Like I just post whatever, like I don't look at like, you know, there's this opportune times to post every week. Like you'll get the most looks at a Tuesday at 4, 8 p.m. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I just fire stuff off whenever the fuck I feel like it. And that's good. I've gotten them happy. I used to be there, uh, you know, I, I would just post whenever I wanted to. But it's funny because now I'm in a position where my engagement, my following, my analytics on my Instagram is monetary. helping me get money. Exactly. It's so, monetary. That's what I was going to say, yeah. Exactly. So I, I have to be – So you know, it's funny that now that I actually want to start caring about it is when um, it's kind of going crazy. We need reels. We need reels. It's just like, oh, God. And I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to make a fucking controversial statement, but the homies that have their nine to five fucking job and they make plenty of money end up being the most fucking opinionated people on the internet and realizing like, yeah, dude, this dude's posting reels because he's got fucking four, you know, three other mouths to feed. Dude. Like that's what... You know what I mean? You yeah. have to you have to really come outside yourself to understand like and it's this also dude loves me. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. That was <laughs> that was it. I was no, just but, uh, I, I on a rant. Man, but, but for those who are you know, because you're implying that someone is like maybe a little salty about that because they have to they don't get to have as fun of a job. Let me tell you, man, what I do is a job too. And it's hard for me, trust me, to put out put myself out Sucks. there, Sometimes. be vulnerable put myself out there on these reels and then, you know, people are going to perceive me a certain way. But what happens is that when you're put into a position, you can either complain about it or you can act on it in the best possible way. 100%. For me, like I created virtual flea and that changed my life and put me in a position. And, um, you know, there's a lot of pros and cons to what came with that. It came with a lot of exposure, that uh, negative exposure, a lot of just like my name and my image and, you know, my family being in people's opinions and memes and a lot of other really negative things, but I can sit here and cry about it, whine about it, or I can be like, I'm here. What do I do next? And I really feel like, um, I got to just work from here. You know, there was, there's no point in me saying, like, I'm going to go back to my quiet little life now. No, I feel like I, uh, was saying we were talking about on the last uh, uh, podcast, God will never give you something that you can't handle. So if you're put in a position, be bold, be brave, continue to have your same good intent. Know why, and just know that you're put there for a reason. So there's a cool, uh, there's a dope meme. There's a cartoon meme that I, I love that uh, it's two dudes tunneling to like the gold, like gold or whatever. And one dude is like there and, and he, but he's going back because he's like, oh, I've gone this far and I haven't found gold. And then like the other dude is like on his way there. So it's the idea like you just have like you're saying, Chris, you just have to push ahead. Like what do you what do you my thing with you now and where you are in this business and you've been part of it for so long? What the fuck else are you gonna do? It's not like you're going back. You know what I mean? Like you're gonna be doing something in vintage for the rest of your. That's how I feel. I mean, granted, mine's only a partial income that I make off of vintage, but still, I can't really imagine my life without it. Like, if the internet goes out and that's not cool anymore and it's not a scene or community, if you think I'm not still going to Brimfield or Rose Bowl every year, you'd be crazy. Of course I am, because I found this and now can't really go back. What are you going to do? You know? We're going to get a nine to five, Chris? No. Yeah, yeah I, mean, gonna I, keep going. I, I can go back. And, but the thing is just like, that's not the meaning of life. You know I mean, in life, I feel like you got to be able to keep pushing and keep figuring out and just like keep challenging yourself, you know? And so here I am and I'm just doing, I'm doing my best is what I'm doing. That's what, always that's what wanted I'm doing. easy, Chris. People have always just wanted it. 
fucking easy. You know, how can I get the most amount of money with the least amount of effort? People don't realize, like, in order for you to gain that popularity, like you were saying, you're in, you're waking up at 2 a.m., getting there every Sunday at 2 a.m. to make sure you were the first one in there to get the dopest spot, to make the most amount of money, to keep the, that dream that you had alive, you know? Like, and I'm a service guy. Reels is like, uh, there's may, some people who may be like, oh, he makes too many reels, he's too goofy now. Uh, which, by the way, that is me. I, that's like, I just love messing around, being funny. If you watch my virtual fleet and you'll see that. But, uh, you know, uh, a part of me just really does have fun making those things like it's just they're they're just fun you know you got you got to accept them for what they are and say say you don't like them well that's okay because there's another group of people who are seeing me make these reels seeing me go from never posting reels or any tiktoks and now seeing me in this time that instagram only wants reels and tiktoks types of videos those sh yeah short form videos that is respecting me for making them because they're like dude this dude you know adapted so it's it, it's it's a good and a bad, and it's always going to be like that. You know? Yeah, sacrifice too. I mean, I know, like, you know, I I uh, I commended you too for doing it during um, like holidays and shit. Like it's Christmas, and this guy's on the fucking internet. You know what I mean? Like, don't take you know people who are maybe watching this and like are like, Arr. it's like, dude, were you on? Were you working twelve hours on Christmas Day? Probably not. You are drunk by five o'clock and asleep. You know, you know, you know what I mean? Because, uh, yeah, we do that because on the holidays, everybody's off, hanging out. Exactly. But so th that's a really good time to go live, guys. Holidays are really good, especially uh, earlier in the day. Yeah. Sure. Because but I'm gonna. I'm, I gotta go back. Afternoon, everybody's drunk. <laughs> I gotta go back, Chris, real quick to this this first time into vintage store. So I walk into Metropolis, t-shirts oh, yeah. all over the fucking. T-shirts all over the wall. I'm walking around. And, dude, I'm in awe at this point. And I've even looked at fucking prices. I just know that this shit is not 20 bucks. These shirts are not $20 a piece. Like, I know that they're, you know, it's New York. It's crazy that you placed your own value on the shirts right away because they very yeah. well may have been. <laughs> yeah. But at this point, at the way back, tucked in the back where it was this, um, it was an Age of Coral Chromag shirt that you don't really see very often for sale anymore because a lot of they're either tucked away or you know they just they don't exist as much maybe they went to, to got destroyed i don't care but anyway so it's up on the fucking top shelf and like an asshole i make the kid i'm like can i look at that t-shirt and i'm thinking in my head i'm like if this thing's 250 i think i'm gonna buy it da, 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 da. takes the thing off the, the shelf it had a price tag on it 950 dollars i go I'm like, that's a real cool shirt, man. <laughs> man, like, I'll, I'll think about it. And I'm like, but that was like, literally, it had a, it had a uh, mushroom cloud on it. But in my head, there was a mushroom cloud of like, holy shit! Like, people get nine hundred fifty, or at least ask nine hundred fifty dollars for fucking a t-shirt. Yeah. And you know, at, at that point, I went home. I was on eBay for like two days straight, eight hours a day, just like looking up values and trying to understand like, why is this one more expensive than this one and that one more expensive than that one? But it isn't even about price too, just why is this more significant than this one? Why is this more significant than that one? So, and it's funny because Rich became a good friend of mine. I still love to, to call him every so often and, and bullshit. But uh, yeah, there that I think people need to understand when they walk in there or like see him at an event, like, He's a he's part of the reason why vintage is as influential now as it, it's ever been because you know that shit opened my eyes for sure. It's crazy. Shout out Rich, man. He's been the yeah. uh, virtual flea MVP buyer. Uh, I think like three times. And I was gonna say that homie comes in like a fucking Tasmanian devil and just <laughs> you know. But uh, no, but that was. Good. I mean, uh, you said earlier you're part-time now with uh, T's. So what do you do? What else do you do? So actually, guys, I'm actually in my uh, – I'll show you. You can see kind of some bottles over there. I, uh, My family for the last 10 months has been building a, uh, a restaurant in, right outside of Boston in a town called Winthrop, Mass. So uh, it's an Italian – I've been in the service industry, if you did, if you know, for anybody who doesn't know, uh, for like 
11 years now. So pretty much right when I got out of high school. I went to college and shit, but I always like went back to it. It's very similar to vintage, Chris, where it's like uh, it's a sub, it's a career or subculture or job that's you know attracts a certain demographic of people, good, bad, or indifferent. But I always felt uh, I know I always felt home at home here, and I love food and, and beverage, and, you know. So that's, that's where I'm at right now. But yeah, that's what you that's got been the focus. That's, yeah, that's in faded. That's awesome. Yeah. That's what you always got to chase. Uh, for me, I've always loved thrifting and uh, never thought I'd do it full time, but uh, I always was there with it, you know, kept it as a hobby. Yeah. And then when the time came, when I had that epiphany, I just didn't hesitate, went to it. And it was crazy, but I was like, man, you got to do, you know, there's a reason why this keeps staying in my heart and I'm, I'm glad I went with it. But uh, are you still doing Coffee with Jays? What's going on with Coffee with Jays and tell people about yeah. that? Anybody so know? Coffee and Jays, like I said, we went for a whole fucking year and then uh not that we got burnt out but we just were like if we really want to still care about this and put time and effort into it we should scale it down a little bit because we were getting to this fucking point where like you know it's 10 hours a day you know every week i mean not 10 hours a day i'm sorry 10 hours a week oh shit I was it just gets <laughs> yeah, i was gonna say that would have been nuts but but in terms of like between though, you got to keep in mind though, for coffee and Jays, it's like we're on for two hours, but there's like a half an hour prep. We like have a fucking meeting after to talk about after, you know, it was turning into like a three hour a day. It was a job. Yeah. And, you know, we weren't getting fucking paid for it and I didn't need to get paid for it, but I'm saying like, you know, who the hell is going to spend three hours a day religiously at something with no no monetary income in it. So it's like we got a little burnt out, but we, we realized we loved doing it. Like I, I love those guys. You know, I've traveled. Jacob's been down in Boston. He came for Faded, and I, you know, I've met him a couple times in New York. Same with Jeremy. Every time I'm in New York, we always spend time together. They're really fucking good guys, you know, and they really well, care about this. Are you doing business. the show anymore, or what's going on? It, yeah, no, no. We so we do it once a week now, and we're kind of in the in the process of trying to scale it, kind of how you do it in a uh, in a um, savable, digestible form. Because to be honest, dude, Instagram is like some days it's down, some days I'm shadow banned, some days I'm this, some days I'm that. Like I hate relying on this this big ass corporate app to tell me when or when or when not like people are gonna be able to see it you know so i'm trying to we're trying to find a way to for people to see what we do and see the content that we create and something that might be still instagram like we might be do like we might do a show every week but we want to have like maybe two shows a week and one be kind of off that and recorded so that's where we're at now do you think you, any of like the world opening up had any effect on it? Like viewership? Oh, like, for sure. Have this energy in it. Cause you know, you're getting pulled now instead of just being able to do the show. Now you got real life. Not that that's not real life, but you know what I'm saying? Like the world opening back up. I, I for me, oh. personally, I did not expect for when the world opened up for it to really kind of yank everything, like tear everything apart. You know, me, I know. Uh, Kirk, uh, virtual, everything is just like, next thing you know, we're just caught up in the world and everything that's going on outside of Instagram live community. I, I said the other day, I was like, it's like when you quit a job and you tell your coworkers, like, don't worry guys, but we'll keep in touch. And then like a week later, you haven't talked to them. <laughs> no one does. Any of them, yeah. you know? It's just like, as the world started opening up, it's like, no, no, this is too late. We're going to be here, you know? But no, man, it's just the world has opened up. And that helps me to do my virtual flea because, you know, I used to have, minimum slow day 150 people viewing bro there was a time where i i pop on to you at like 250 yeah. 300 like dude put it in perspective that at one point 300 people were staring at their phone watching you even like i know that doesn't right. sound like a ton of people but that's a fucking ton of people dude i, I learned something people. about myself in that time i learned that i like to be even crazier when there's more people watching i like to just really be a fucking nut <laughs> <laughs> oh, homies were taking shirts off and shit, screaming, yelling. Dude, I honestly, it was, uh, yeah, bro, it wasn't that's... even just, go ahead, go it wasn't even just, it was entertainment, Chris, too. You have yeah, to keep in mind what you, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I learned that about myself. It was crazy, man. And then uh, even when we did the pilot, when we did the pilot show uh, for the for the show we were going to do, uh, we were in front of a live studio audience. I I even get nervous just talking in front of like three people. Like if three people were looking at me and I have to say something, like I get nervous. Yeah, what was that like? Can we talk about that? Because I've never actually been able to talk to you just face to face. Even if we're on Coffee and Jays, it's like those those two clowns are there too like i want to know what what it was what it was like yeah you know, was, jacob was, and jerry but well going into, it, I, going into it i was just like uh i had already had a lot of confidence built up from virtual fleet because just doing virtual mm -hmm. fleet was something that i didn't know that i could do like so, taking a selfie of myself recording myself it was just all awkward and i never really wanted to ever do it so when i did the first live the first virtual fleet i did it because i was like let's help people pandemic is crazy you know, people don't have as many followers as I do. So let's see if we can expose them to my followers. And, you know, that'll be my pay it forward moment. And then I'll forget about it. But then it ended up being what it is now, which is, you know, a bunch of virtual flea episodes and hours and hours and hours of just being live. And once I got used to it and got comfortable with it, I was like, I can't believe I'm doing this. And I got so confident in it when we would have 300, 400. And when it went up to a thousand people watching the live at one time. I was like, dude, I, I love it. Like, I'm, I come alive with the camera. Fed off of it too. I, I yeah, I, fought, I feed off of it, but I come alive with, with the pressure. So when it came to doing the uh, pilot in front of everyone in a live studio audience, I was like, this is terrifying to me right now. But I know that once that camera turns on, I become another person. And sure enough, dude, when we went in there, I was nervous. Seeing all the people, I was nervous. But, uh, you know, getting in position in front of the camera, I'm fucking nervous. And But as soon as they're like, all right, hit it. I mean, even the producers, man, the producers had filmed other parts of the show before they did my part. And on set, I'm just kind of just like quiet and just like taking everything all in and just tripping out. And I could tell, I could see it in their face. They're like, is this our guy? Is this the guy that's yeah. going to fucking host the... But yeah, but, but but sure enough, man, once we were in front of that camera and they were like, all right, go, dude, I just came alive. And honestly, that was like a drug to me. I want to get back to that. Some, like, I need, I want to have a show. I, I know I would kill a show. See, people, that's, that was, that's my bug too, Chris. And I think that's why I want to, people got, before I did this, I was a part-time musician too. So I'd performed in front of 10 people and a thousand people. And like you, every the toughest part of performing is like the fucking five minutes before you go on stage and the minute while you're on stage. And then after that, it's like, I'm up here. So I might as well just either figure it out or, or fail. It's like a fight or flight type of thing. So it, for me, it was an easy transition to get into doing this because I'd always been the goofy guy that, you know, might have inside been scared shitless to like get up there in front of people. But like to the outside world convinced these people that I was like, I do this all the time. I know what I'm doing. I'm, you know, I'm big goofy Joe, you know, like, yeah, you man, know. I swear those producers were, I could feel the energy when they were shooting other things and they were just before they had seen me perform. Cause I was the last part and they're just, I could just feel they were like, you know, this guy, I don't know about this guy. He's too quiet. He doesn't have, he just, he's crazy. But once we did the pilot after bro, they were hugging me. They were like, oh, man, that was perfect. We love it. Uh, did not expect it to be that good. And and so because of Virtual Flea, I, just, I learned something about myself, which is that I come alive when the camera's on, the lights turn on. I become a different person. So it's I'm almost now I have, good, I have like another personality thing, yeah. that I just rely on. So when, it's, when it comes to like crunch time shit, so Angel, Angel Alzona, you know Angel. Angel's great. Oh, yeah. She hooked me up with this red carpet gig where I was going to be uh, interviewing celebrities on the red carpet. That's dope. Yeah, it was right. like this Australian and American kind of like we're in the, boots in the movie industry type of band and we're going to give awards to Australian and American actors and people in the movie business. Some fucking gig. So You're I like, did, okay? Uh, all right, yeah, I'll, I'll be there. <laughs> yeah, so I did a, uh, I was with Ron, I, I like interviewed Ron Howard, uh, it was super crazy, Brian Grazer, and again, super nervous. But I just relied on the other dude. I'm like, it's like the Hulk, you know what I mean? I was just like, I'm, just, I'm just gonna have the other guy come out, and I don't even have to worry about it. 
And sure enough, dude, when I went nervous all the way up there, but then, but not too nervous. Like, cause now I know I'm like, I could just rely on the other people. Sure enough. Not like shaking. Once we get there, yeah. boom, the big guy comes out. And then once it's done, I'm back to just being like, wow, that dude killed it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what a lot of people need. To, my brother was an actor for a long time. A lot of people need to realize like, it's fucking acting. Like this dude might be a really shy, whatever dude, but like when that camera comes on, he becomes maybe even the truest form of yourself, Chris. Maybe, maybe it just took you till now to realize that you needed the fucking camera in front of you to, to really express yourself. Yeah. That's all. That's all it is. You know, I, uh, I'm a very like, uh, I'm an idiot though. I do shit when people aren't looking. My girlfriend, I, I can't believe Chloe hasn't killed me yet. Like I'll, we'll be out like in public and I'll be making stupid faces or fucking with people. And, you know, it, you know, I'm, it can't. It has to do with where I came from too. Boston's like the most sarcastic place on earth. But uh, no, I think that you just maybe you just came into your own with with this. Finally realized it takes certain people. Chris, people are eighty year old people die without realizing what their true potential was or what they really loved in life. So I'm glad that you found it. Yeah, man. Consider it's yourself. Cool. An and now that I found it, the, the the game is to keep pushing that. Keep going in that direction. Keep trying things. You know, now that we're going back to that conversation we were having of once you're in a position, you have to keep pushing and trying new things. It's not that as some people may perceive it as, oh, he's greedy. Or, you know, like when you got the bit stitch thing for a uh, copy with Jay's, or you guys are sellouts. Like, it's not that. It's that we're here and the name of the game is to keep progressing and trying new different things to – uh enhance the quality of what we're doing here you know it's let's see how far we can take this it's about advancing progression it's not about greed or i want to be famous or i'm making reels or tiktoks because i want to be famous it's just it's just steps taking steps and yeah. that's me talking to whoever doesn't understand that is hating on it this is me also talking to anybody who's in that same position don't be afraid to keep pushing remember why you do it remember your intent and you, um be on be relentless in that in that pursuit. Yeah. For have you found uh, as as a lot of joy coming came from like going back to your like I love that you're going back to your roots and selling again. Mm-hmm. How's that been for you? Like, how, is it is it weird to be back there? Or? I love it, man. Yeah. It feels like I'm you know laying in the bed that I made. In that you know it's a different type of market now. People have different expectations of numbers and values of T-shirts than they did when I was doing it before virtual flea. And uh, it's you know I'm excited to come out on the other end of this, being like, look, we did some crazy, and I I swam in that in that pool too. You know I laid down in that bed too, and uh, you know any anybody could do it. You know I'm not above it. I love that I was able to. Well, for, for me, that got me back to being like, being like, this motherfucker ain't Hollywood, dude. He's one of us, you know. He's, one day, dude. One day, at the flea <laughs> one day at the flea market, I was, and I'll always do that, man, because I love the flea. I love finding new teas. I love not knowing what I'm going to find, finding crazy shit. I'll always do that. But, yeah, somebody one day when I was at the flea at, like, fucking butt crack early was like, yo, this man really be in the trenches. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And it's like, and it's like, what? Like, it's like some like, fucking eighteen-year-old kid or something. Nothing, but that sounds cool. Yeah, I really be in the trenches. <laughs> yeah. No, I know. I uh, I love it. Dude. Like, I I don't think I bought one thing at Brimfield. I went to Brimfield on Wednesday. I didn't buy one thing, but I will always go every season. Like, I just have to go. It's like, you know, you get to see people that you have very cool people that you you don't get to see very often you get to really appreciate a business that's like when I talk to people, like I talk to a woman who's been selling for 42 years, like put that into fucking perspective. Like she's been selling 10 years longer than I've been alive and she's still here. You know what I mean? So like the one word of advice, which I'm sure you have already instilled in people is like, if you want to be about this, be about it. Like really, you don't have to fucking, go to the bins seven days a week and shit or whatever. They're closed on Sundays, right? <laughs> no, not they closed on Sundays. Open every day. No, yours are? I think mine might be, but I'm, whatever. Uh, they're, um, they're open seven days. Like, you don't have to go to the bins seven days a week, but you need to realize, like, if you want to be about this scene or whatever, just 
you can be. You just have to do it. Just fucking do it. You don't have to be at the binge. If you do hauls or whatever your business is, maybe you just like vintage. You don't have to be a millionaire you know, making money on vintage. You just have to like it. Like, yeah, people you know, ask I think that that's the point. I've been asked a lot, like, do you think someone can come in the game right now and kill it and, and do it full time? Like Fuck it. yes. And the answer is, for me, yes and no. Yes, because come in, if you have an angle and you're a hard worker and you execute on all your ideas, you're not lazy, uh, do, yes. But if you're going to come in to try to do it like, you know, the way it's been done before, the way, uh, you know, if you're not going to try to bring any kind of like creativity to it, you might get stuck. You know, yeah, so, yeah, definitely right. bring your own sauce to it, and you see that all the time. Look at you, you brought your own sauce to it. You know, you brought your, you brought yeah. the like a Boston personality to it. Like, hey, what's up, Chris? Like, you know, just big and fun, and uh, yeah. had fun with it, man. I, yeah, I feel bad because I'm at the point now where like, you know, I've I've worked hard enough and sold enough shit, and now I'm collecting things where like I only have an eye for what I really want at the moment. So it's like. I feel almost bad when people are like, what's the price on this? And I tell them the price and they're like, and I think they want to, you know, they, they don't want to be like, dude, I can't pay that. But they want to, Oh, I'll think about it. But it's like, you don't have to buy my stuff. Like I don't get upset if like you, you, you can't afford my stuff or like, maybe you don't understand enough about the piece to be like, I'm going to spend my money on this. But it's a weird thing now too, where like people I think don't really care as much about the piece, but like, can I make money off this? You know what I mean? Where, like, before, I think people at one point were buying things just because they loved it and not because they were so concerned with the fucking dollar amount of it. I hope – that's my only hope for the scene is, like – and I think, realistically, that's how the value of things might even grow is, like, people now have just been, like, oh, well, that shit I know went for 400 I'm going to give them 300 Oh, that's it. And then da 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 And then you just move on. And then before you know it, the fucking T-shirt that was 1000 bucks is $10 because – you know, everyone's just trying to make their little money off of it. It's like just my my thing now is just I love I love it, dude. Yeah. Whether it's a shirt, whether it's a pair of pants, whether it's uh, and I'm more focused too, Chris, on the fashion of it and how it looks on the human on the body. Yeah. As opposed to like like I bought like a two thousand. I still have it. I bought like a two thousand. Two like Patty Smith Maplethorpe shirt. It's on my Instagram now. And granted, like that picture was probably taken twenty years ago, but for some weird reason, I bought it because I just loved how it looked, you know. And I, it didn't even fit me. Like I, I figured, like it'll. I love how it looks on someone that can wear it, you know. But I just I buy things. Has your? I know, like obviously, it's a business for you, but like, what what catches your eye? Yeah, do you become attached afraid, to stuff? Bro, honestly, I'm not afraid to pivot. I'm not afraid to say right now, I'm done with tees. I'm moving on to fucking whatever. You know what I mean? I'll say it. But I think, you a, have lot of to. People, I think a lot of people Businesses. saw the popularity of tees and were like, all right, they want it to die. It's like, bro, it's like for me personally, I can't. I can't stop like seeing a good tee and wanting to wear it. The t-shirt is a giant cultural phenomenon that is here to stay. I really do believe that. and. You know, to say that vintage is going to – vintage T-shirts are going to be done is to say that the T-shirt is going to be done. Because think about what a T-shirt is. It's a form of expression. And one of the most unique oh, yeah. forms uh, of expression is wearing a vintage T-shirt that nobody else has, aging. Like you said, it goes back to – oh, shit, I just answered the question from earlier. goes back to when the shirt was made. You know what I'm saying? Like all that <laughs> is a form of expression. When you wear a shirt from the time that the shirt was made and the band was popular, for example – uh, you're showing people that you have a little bit of culture to you. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. That's a form of expression. You care. So, yes, I do have a, a lot of uh, appreciation for a lot of different things going on right now in the secondhand uh, fashion community. For example, I love the true, vis true vintage look, like the smaller T-shirts, the bell-bottom pants, the crop T-shirts. I'm loving it. I have a guy actually have an idea that I, I want to tell him, dude, style me. And I want to make like a reel for it because the, the, the styling reels have been doing okay for me. So I want to mm -hmm. be like, oh, like I'm going to give you my measurements. Give me a fit. I'm going to put it together. I'm going to shout you out and say, you styled me for this reel. Because I really do love it. But I just don't think that I'll ever be like, I don't want to wear T-shirts. Because I just think. Dude, it's the most accessible. 
it's the most accessible the piece popularity of and just want it to be done already and i think they're mad that it's not because it just can't bro it's too sick it's dope <laughs> it's the most accessible piece of fashion for, i mean for, uh because everybody in their mother wears a t-shirt no matter who you are whether it's a blank white tee under your fucking button up or whether it's uh thousand dollar t-shirt everybody wears t everyone wears t-shirts it's as ex it's like as accessible as fucking underwear and you yeah. know I've seen like some of these really cool reels on instagram like people in this outfit that they put together and it's just like all this you know but at the end of the day you can't like my style and i've said this before is is I, if i could describe my style in one word it's practical like what can you just throw on look good in and it doesn't look like that's good though it, it doesn't look like, oh, this dude spent all morning or look at how this dude put so much effort in. Because that's the thing. It's like, dude, calm down with the fit. Can you wear that to the movies? And the argument is, yes, you can. And you can. But this looks like, this, like an outfit like this or probably what you're wearing, it looks like, yo, this dude's cool. He's a cool dude. He's just a dude, but also is fresh and has yeah. to do it. It doesn't look like... Like how many motherfuckers... Yeah, I dressed in a purple uh, blouse like Prince to go to fucking see the new horror movie. You know what I mean? No one's doing it. Like, I'm sure someone out there is, but I, I understand what you're saying, too. Going to a baseball you know, game, I, are you going to wear the freaking crop button up with the bell bottoms and the snakeskin boots? Are yeah. you going to do that? If you are, that's fine. But I'm just saying, like, you just can't be practical. And if you can make practical yeah. look dope, that's, that's my style. Yeah, the cool part about... Um, so to talk about a little bit about Faded, the cool part about Faded was... Yes, that's, uh, that's actually the next point that I have. Let's talk about some... Is that, yeah, so fa essentially Faded was... I'll tell you the lineage of Faded. Sam and I became really good friends uh, over time, and we've only been friends for like a two-year period or whatever, but I was chatting with them, and I'm like, dude, like, I see all these great events, like Chris is doing events, you know, all these guys are doing events, like... I want to try something that's a little bit weird and a little bit off the beaten path. And Sam being, I'll be honest with you like that whole museum shit is a lot of, of Bowie, dude. He's Sam Bowie Coke mirror. So I'm talking about, uh, he's always he's been a super fun. I started, even when I started, he was, yeah, like, he's super fucking creative. And I, it didn't start like that. It started as like, yo, like, would you be into doing an event or whatever? And then I didn't hear anything from Sam for like two weeks. And then I remember being, I literally remember this. I was at my um, girlfriend's cousin's house. He lives in Quincy, which is just outside of Boston. But it's, he has like a little, he's like a little balcony. And Sam calls me. And I'm like, oh, cool. I got to take this. So I go out there and he's like, yeah, I talked to my friend Long, who is like super connected in Providence. He's a really great um, event coordinator, blah, blah, blah. And obviously like Ryan and I were really good friends, at the, like good friends at this point. I'm like, Ryan, Ryan's in, like, we should, let's just do this. So it turned into these four dudes that were very like-minded, that all had their strengths in their certain places. And uh, it came together, like, really, well. like, I literally, like, love it. Like, Faded for me is, like, a full-time job, uh, you know, that I don't get paid for on the day-to-day. -day. Like, we're, the, we're, I've annoyed Sam at countless hours. I'm calling him at midnight to share this fucking stupid idea that he probably, you know, doesn't give a shit about. But, like, you know, we, we're very – all of us, as uh, the four of us, are so invested in this. Um, so, yeah. I met them through being with, local, just, like, meeting in person. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah I met Ryan for the first time, actually, because he worked at the store called Thrive Exchange that was on Newberry Street, which is, like, uh, best way to describe it, Chris, is, like, the Rodeo Drive of Boston but way less lit. Like, it's just, you know, it's like a high-end fashion district in Boston. But there was a dope thrift store um, that was, like, curated, like Metropolis and stuff. But he was the buyer and, like, the main dude for that, other than the owner. So I walked in one day with, like, 25 tees, and I sold them all to him. And uh, we exchanged info. And then for a while, he was crushing it because I was selling him all these tees that were, like, fucking 100 bucks a piece for, like – $25 because I knew nothing about the fucking business, but rightfully so. It's almost like to me, I looked at it as like buying my way in a little bit. Cause like these dudes didn't know me for a hole in the wall. They were all doing their own shit. I was a new guy on the scene. So I have to do, you know, it's like an apprentice or whatever. Like you need to find your way in 
yeah. to, to get noticed, you know? Um, so I ended up meeting him and then I ended up partying at a, Brian invited me to the Boston tea party right when it was starting. So this was like the first like couple of weeks it started for the lack of like, I don't want to get too candid on this fucking thing or whatever, but we literally partied to use your imagination till fucking 5 AM so much so that I took an Uber back to my apartment and the Uber driver said, good morning, sir. Like, like it was like, it was like, it was like 6 AM in the morning, you know? So, um, That's the best. what I, but what I, I knew right away, Chris, is I love, I liked these guys, you know, like they were really fucking cool dudes. And Sam was they there already? Do, yeah, they would. Yeah. Sam would come like, cause him and, uh, Brian and Bowie had become friends over time. Like Sam would come, and just hang out. And uh, I real this is when Sam was living in Boston still. So um, I just liked these dudes. You know, I was like, these guys are cool. I could hang out with them. They partied as hard as I did. Um, uh, you know, they seem like really, really stand up dudes. So um, that that's how the relationship built. And then, in honest, honestly, a short period of time, we all kind of were like, you know, we want to create an event. That is not, it's, it's dope dealers at its core. It's like great fucking sellers, all ages from, you know, from 18 to 70. Like it doesn't, fade is not one of these things where like it's, it's an, all, I wanted to create something that was like super all inclusive where you could get any, you could get a fucking blouse from 1910 or you could get, you know, the dopest rap tea on earth. But we, create, we wanted to create that, but also a way to mold the artists that created this stuff with... I did, like, a little fucking spin move there. No, that's the art, I've the, always wanted that. I've always said, like, we need to, you know, merge the military with the true, with the T-shirts, and just make it all one big thing. You know what I'm saying? It's all I'm great. Sure. I hate that I that I go on a live, and I can only sell T-shirts, and if I try to sell, like, a hoodie or pants, and people are like, Ugh. You know what I mean? Like, we got to open up to make this a whole world, you know? And I, I love that your guys' event made that happen. Like I was seeing the videos of like tees and, you know, you had that one vendor that hit like five figures selling true. And uh, I just think that was awesome. That was one of my favorite things. Yeah. It's like the cool part too, is like the, the demographic of people that showed up because we also, you got to keep in mind guys, when we do faded, uh, you know, we, we'll have a DJ, there's a pre thing. We did like a panel where we interviewed people. So we tried to make it like a weekend. So we did the interview. Uh, and we interviewed people on Friday. How we were the panels? That, were the panels actually lit? Like people asking questions? Was there energy in there? Dude, we had, you know, it was fucking gnarly because I was so nervous because I show up to the panel really early and I'm hanging out with like um, Joe Perez, Joey Mars, and Sean Taggart. So these are all dudes that I like fucking admire and like geek over like because they've all done really creative amazing artistic things and i'm just sitting there like how the fuck did i get here like i'm doing sh like perez and i are like doing tequila shots and shit before the the panel like because we're both just like nervous like we're like holy fuck i gotta get up and talk in front of like 100 people but when it first hap first started trickling in there was only like 10 people and i'm like oh fuck like, is this thing gonna be a bust and then, dude, like, 10 minutes later, there's 100 people, 120 people in this panel, like, just, like, all sitting, watching us just talk about um, kind of what got us to this specific place, you know? And it was, it was crazy to be like, I'm sitting asking questions next to the dude uh, that created all these album covers for Kanye, who, you know... Like, I know you're a big Kanye fan like I am. I'm like, how the fuck did I get here? Like, I don't, I'm some goofy asshole from Boston who, you know. And I think maybe that's where some apprehension comes from people from, to me is like. Yeah, it's your enthusiasm, bro. It's your passion. It's like how much you love to learn about stuff and how much you love this shit. So, yeah, that's, that goes back again to uh, can someone get in the game now and do a full time. And again, it's about your enthusiasm. It's about your impact, your passion and your ability yeah. to you know, that like you were that saying, drive your ability to adapt to different things. Like back, like can people still get in the game for sure? But do they have to work twice as hard, three times as hard? Yes. Like if you think you're gonna 
Like, I'm tired of, like, this is my biggest pet peeve, Chris, of all time. But did you and, like two, three times as hard? I think you're all passion, bro, because you you weren't at the bands. Like, you just came in, you're a no, 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 but I, wor- I worked in a different way. I didn't work in the idea of being at the bins, but I worked in the idea of literally um, sacrificing even, like, I mean, Chloe will tell you this, sacrificing my relationships with other people to spend time either on the internet or... Um, sourcing or looking at stuff or you know what i mean like i literally like you know it might have been a shorter trajectory maybe only four years since i've been really heavy into this but like i've literally like missed you know certain things or or had you know relationship riffs because i was doing vintage instead of doing this thing with my friends or whatever or my girlfriend that they want to be like i I made sacrifices in different ways that weren't just like showing up at the bins. Definitely. Um, you know? I'm not saying you didn't make any sacrifices. I, do, I just think like from when I started, it was just like be at the thrift all fucking day, selling the sun all, you know, on the weekends. And that's all you could do. Just, you know, but now it's like, we've taken it so high to all these different things. And now there's, you know, the Chris, 2016 Chris would have had a lot more to come into and deal with coming into the game than he did back in 2016 and but there's still people coming in at you know the different levels and thriving and I think it has a lot to do with just like having a positive attitude and yeah not being afraid to work because there's people like you we also got um I always go back to uh Frank as well new dude oh Frank's a hot, him and I are very similar when we came from the same I mean he was deeper into music, but we both came from the music background, and we you both come Frank from and Wiz, that East Coast, just like type yeah. of attitude. Well, I, I, I think about this, Chris, about anything I've ever done in my entire life. I never want to just do it. I want to be the best I possibly can be at it. Like, and I, I spend a lot of time thinking about stuff, and you know with with clothing and stuff like my buys like i think about it and i make sure I'm, it's calculated and it's not just like flying by the i mean i fly by the seat of my pants it's funny but you what, know what do you, what do you frank and wiz have in common if anything do you think besides three smart ass motherfuckers three big mouth you know what i mean i love wiz i love frank ah I've had great com- – I was – to be honest, shout out Wiz. I was wary about him at first because I didn't know enough about him. I was like, dude, who's this lit-ass Miami guy? Fucks you know about vintage. And then, like, I met him and I was like, oh, dude, like, him and I would get into some serious fucking trouble together, dude. We are very similar in, in a lot of – same with Frank. Like, Frank was every rad band dude that I'd ever met on tour doing merch for whatever. You know what I mean? Like, he was – that we were very all, and we have both have that. We all have that East Coast smart ass mentality that I think we gravitate. You know. Yeah, you know what's funny is like not saying that you did, but like I, anytime new people come in, I never really judge off of like their behavior or the way they are. You know, I never judge or try to understand oh, motives, yeah. but I just look at your passion for collecting or what you sell or just how hyped you get when when it comes to this thing. And so uh, I don't think there's ever been anybody that comes in. And I'm like, oh, who is this guy trying to come in for this and this? Uh, I'm always very, like, welcoming. So, like, you, uh, Kirk, uh, just cool dudes that I just admired how much energy you guys have towards this, you know? Yeah. And, dude, you can meet the cool – that that was the story I said at the way beginning that I'll stay right now. You can meet the coolest fucking people. There's a homie – uh, I have from England. I'm, I won't drop his name because I don't want to fucking put him on blast. But he, at one point, was buying, like, thousands of dollars of vintage for me. Like, in, like, a two-month span, he's dropped, like, 4K with me. And I'm like, who the fuck is this guy? I'm like, this guy is fucking buying all this really cool shit from me. But I have never really seen him. He doesn't really have a page, da 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 da, da. I post a Nick Cave because uh, I'm a fan, like, I like Nick Cave, the musician. I posted something about Nick Cave, and he DMs me, and he goes, oh, you like Nick Cave? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, and then at that point, I asked him, too. I'm like, what do you do? Like, what's your job? He's like, oh, well, I own, like, the record label that Nick Cave's on. Like, he's coming to Boston in two weeks. Do you want guest lists? Do you want to go see him, like, for free or whatever? And I'm like, 
fuck you know what i mean like but don't that goes to anybody in vintage is like don't um take for granted the amazing people that you can meet through this and it's just like you know i'm sitting there fucking you know 15 rows back but in like a prime seat for like watching a legend you know and i don't it wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for for vintage so Let's go back to faded, man. So the panel was great, and then uh, tell me more about the event, man. Because I slept, I didn't, I didn't make it, and I'm, I'm like, I missed I, that. Yeah, tell me that. I would have loved you there, and I hope I really. This is the olive branch, Chris, to hope that you can either vend or do whatever, any capacity you want to do a faded, the next faded. But it was, it was amazing. What we, what I wanted to do though, and I'm happy we did do, was create a full experience for people. Like it's not just you go to the show. You leave the show and then nothing happens. Like there was a pre, a dope pre-party, a dope after party, plenty of events with food trucks. We had food trucks. We had a bar. Um, we had um, like we did like the BL crack. Shout out Bid Stitch and Drew for making that happen. Like we um, we created an entire experience for people that I wanted people to leave and say like I had a really good time. You know, it's like. Why is Coachella? Man, all I heard is great things about the show and all the videos. Yeah. I'm telling you, I was major. The FOMO was hitting heavy. Yeah, and it was like the greatest part about the show was a lot of the dealers. I mean, I granted, not everyone can make four figures or five figures, whatever. A lot of the dealers did really well, which to me, as a as an event, put someone that puts on an event, the four of us only fo- biggest focus, not only focus, biggest focus is a the dealers enjoy themselves to make and make money. Second, the guests enjoy themselves and have a good time. Like those, those are the only two things that I really care about. It's not about clout. It's not about how many fucking people know about the show. I want to create a great experience for my people. You know, and I'm sure you felt that way with virtual. It's like, I want as a seller myself, it's like, if my vendors aren't going to do good, I don't even want to have to, the show don't have the fucking gig like the fact that, oh i don't care i'm putting on an event if they don't make money then blah, 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 blah. you know even so much to the fact of like i found out a couple people didn't make make money or didn't do well and i really like wanted to get down to the nitty-gritty of like how can i you know help you next time yeah. to maximize your yeah you man know, I, potential I feel that way too. but i think at the end of the day is you as the person throwing the event have to do your best to promote it and get people in the door and then uh, once you do that, you know, uh, you can't be at every stand and selling the teas for the people. That's what I've learned because I beat myself up a lot. But also I'm like people who have bad time at my event. It's like you you thought that you could just charge crazy amounts because you're at a virtual event. You know what I mean? It's still an event that you it, there's still a market. There's still you can't just tax people just because, you know, people aren't. I mean, it does happen like the money's flowing at virtual. but. Uh, a lot of times it's it's up to that seller. It's outside of your control, bro, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. It's gotta be, it's gotta be that's what I tell people about pricing is like you need to understand at an event, you need to be slightly below the comp below the comps, or motherfuckers are gonna buy it on the internet. People Why am I gonna buy it? From- exactly. Yeah. People wanna come with crazy, like crazy prices, and they also wanna come with uh not that good pieces that they wanna get. That's another thing in, in vintage is like people think they have that fire shit. And it's just like, bro, we've seen that a bunch of times or it's just not that good or, you know, it's a size medium. Yeah, you've seen that sell for this much in the XL, but there's just a lot of variables, you know? So like as, as an event thrower, as long as you do, and you guys really rolled, that, rolled it all out, you know, made it, made it a whole experience. Uh, if certain vendors don't hit like that, it's a lot of, at one point, at what point does it become the event's fault? And at what point does it become... Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. And I, if we didn't have a dope event, I would have, you know, then you have to go back to the drawing board too. And re- or you didn't sell a lot. You go back to the drawing board. You don't give up. You know what I mean? Or maybe you do give up because that's maybe you weren't, your heart wasn't in it like you wanted to, but it's like for us for faded Two, which I'll, I'll use this platform. Thanks Chris to, uh, I'm not going to announce the date, but I will tell you by October 1st, there will be, a second date for faded and it'll be ample time to, to attend it. If you, if people want to, but at least tell um, us, is it going to be an annual event or are we getting another it'll one? It'll be an annual, it will be an annual event. Reason being 
is because there's so many amazing events out there that like I can't and the amount of time that it takes us to plan this is so insane that um we literally couldn't it couldn't happen even twice a year. My, you know, Chloe was telling me when we first did this, she's like, you're only doing this once a year, right? And I'm like, no, I was thinking maybe we'll do it like, uh, you know, every four or five months. And then she's like, no, you're not. I'm like, what? I'm like, yeah, we are. She's like, okay. And then literally we do the event and Sam, Sam Ryan Long and I are like, ah. We're like, yeah, I think it's only going to be, you know, once a year because I can. had a long lead up to it too, and I think that worked out really well. Yeah. How how did that? Well, you guys? that definitely helped. You know, uh, people don't realize like, well, people maybe realize that faded's not like. Uh, I don't make the announcement in July and then the shows even a month and a half later. Like we make the announcement and then literally it is like, it is like five or six days a week. Uh, some sort of content, some sort of business thing, some sort of artist uh, collab or like, you know, trying to get an artist contract. It's like, it's, it's literally a, 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 you know, an all year affair. It's not something that just like happens overnight. And like for anybody, Chris, you know, you put on events, they're fucking stressful, dude. It's like, there's so many factors that are outside of your control too, that you just need to like pray that they all work out. Right. Like, uh, you know, the, the vendor, you know, I feel bad too. Like I've had, I've had vendors where like their shipment didn't come in, you know, for, for them to, to vend their clothes or whatever. Like it's crazy though, that with all that lead time that you guys gave yourself, there was still a bunch of stuff that came down to like crunch time or probably didn't. The wire. <laughs> Bro, so much so where like a day before the gig, we were like, fuck, do we, we you know, which we're not going to do this next time because it just, for us and for our dealers, it, I don't want to ha- have either of us rely on this, but like we promised racks to a bunch of people and like literally at Home Depot fucking yelling at the service chick um, and not, and feeling horrible because I'm yelling at her because like I don't, not yelling at her, but like upset with her because she doesn't have the fucking racks that I, that 10 or 12 of our best dealers need for the fucking the show and it's like we luckily sorted it out made it happen but like you said it's out of your just out of your control some of this shit it's like so down to the wire where you're like i'm dealing with trauma flashbacks right now virtual yeah i mean how can i let me ask you we're just like uh should we cancel should we cancel it did you fuck up yeah (laughs) i I bet dude we were there let me ask you a question what how this was virtual. Do you, do you plan on doing virtual again? Was virtual a moment in time that you loved and that maybe you will do again? Or because I don't know, if, I I don't want to put you on the spot, but I know many. I haven't. I don't know if anybody's asked you that. Yeah, no, definitely that. both, man. It, it's it's it was great when it happened, you know, and and the frequency that we were doing it. I think you know before the world opened up go, again, going back to the world opening up and like uh, taking more than we expected it to. It's like we're right back to it, you know. Shit is crazy. But um, but also we will have another. We definitely will have. Okay, another. rad. Well, I'm stoked on that, dude. I really, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll be there. You know, I want to be there to support it, and I hope that uh, I know it'll. Yeah, be man, great. it was fun you seeing know, but... you in Chicago. I wish we would have hung out more. Uh, but you know, you know, dude, when you it's... have that event, you're getting yanked in ten different directions at all times. Yeah. It's one of those things where now I'll come in a day earlier. We can get fucking dinner before. Uh, I still oh, need that side man. No, wait, did we have a drink together? We did, right? We cheers to a shot or something? Yeah, we did a shot at the um, trade pit and shit, and it was awesome. But we, the one thing I will give you credit for, too, and people who are watching this is, like, you guys did a really good job of canning ball on that and being like, yo, this event was great. Maybe I'll put on my own event. Like, the, ins- the inspiration of it, too, and – you know, Jacob's the same way in Canada doing his uh, fly market shit. He's inspired a ton of events around him where, you know, it takes one guy to do it and a bunch of people to realize. But to do it in your own and they way. Could all, and they way. could all exist. You know what I mean? Like I remember in yeah. Chicago, uh, ThriftCon had their event uh, the next day on Sunday. Oh, and Mars is he, a killer, dude. They, they're crazy. And what happened was all those people came to uh, Chicago and then they were like, we're flying out in the morning or tonight to 
I forgot where the thrift con was. And I was like, oh, dude. So, you know, we could all, everybody eats. We could all have an event. Dude, I was, you know I was standing in line with Kelly, with Kelly Cole chatting with him. And he, that was his trajectory, dude. He's like, I'm going to virtual. I'm going to go. I'm going to buy. I'm out of here. And then I'm sharing a hotel room with Rich at uh, ThriftCon, you know, or, and I'm like, but to me, to go back full circle of what we're talking about, about like, if you want to be in this industry or this business, those are the people and that type of attitude is how you really fucking make it is realizing like sacrifices being there, dude. Like, dude, I had, you know, I, I'm not a rich man, but I knew that I was buying a plane ticket to Chicago my, with Chloe to fucking come support virtual, you know what I mean? Or I knew I was going to LA last year for ThriftCon to come support. So, you know, do it. That's my biggest advice to anybody who wants to, to do it. It's just to fucking do it. Uh, back to Faded. Uh, I saw that crazy ass video that kind of was like shared all over the Vince community of the uh, bail getting cracked open. What the heck was that? What was that about? Anybody? Break go. Um, yeah. So it actually came, we saw some gnarly one overseas. I don't know if it was Thailand or something. And like, it was fucking mayhem. And um, I know that Bowie had that idea way before that, but that was my realization of like, holy shit, like this looks dope. Like even for me, like I just want to fucking do a backflip into this like thousand pound barrel of clothing, like just for the experience. So um, we went to Bid Stitch and we're like, yo, we want to make this happen. How do we make it happen? And they like, dude, they fucking, I got to give it to them. Like put their nose to the grind and drew like, did us a, a bail and the thing that like drew said to me and sam specifically and that no, i don't think anybody else knows is drew's like yo i'm making a bail and i'm gonna put some stuff good stuff in there but like i'm making a bail that like the real vintage dudes get like i'm not making you know what i mean like i'm not putting seventy thousand bangers in there like i'm i'm making you dig because like this is what I've been doing for so long. And this is the truest expression about, of what it's really like. I mean, you can attest to that, Chris, like when you're going through rag houses or bail, you know, bales and stuff, you're not coming up with fucking 18 rap tees. You oh, know, that rap tea. that though, is that what people were saying? Were they saying like that they wish there was more bangers? Well, there? you know, you have like, the dude, occasional bail. What are you complaining about? <laughs> <laughs> Look, me, cost you me, experienced as I am, I know that when I see a bail, never is it going to be all bangers. Never. Like, it's fucking, it was $20 to literally, we have like, this you know, ba- we, oh, it was. we had bags that were like this big. It was like 20 bucks to fill the bag. Bro, even if you just paid 20 bucks and filled the bag with rags, it's like, you could still, it's a $20 for a pack of rags at fucking Home Depot. You know, you know what I mean? Like, it's it's one of those things where you're doing, you were doing it for the experience. And I'm so thankful that we yes, had the people. Right there, doing it for the experience. And that was like your cool little, like, you know, community viral moment for the event. I thought that was so fucking cool. Dude. Yeah, it was just fun. And I know that, like, you know, to be honest, dude, I'll tell you the funniest part about it is we didn't think it was going to arrive on time, which was like the scariest shit to me. Like, Drew's like, yeah, it's on the truck. And like, it was like, it arrived two days before the event, but that Monday it hadn't arrived yet. And I'm like, fuck. I'm like, we literally promised these people a bail and it's not here. So uh, I was like, I was like, how do we pick a, you know, can we write a, can we rent a mass truck? I'll meet this fucking thing, wherever it is. Like, we got to get this thing to. Events to are, stre- it's like stress, stress, stress. And then it's day of event. And it's just like, fuck it. Whatever is here is here. Yeah. And then just the most amazing time walking around your event. You're so proud. Everyone's all smiles, all the chaos before the event. You totally forget about it. Uh, te- and then there's a third part to it. So there's chaos, then bliss. And then there's a third part. We'll get to the third part, but tell me about your bliss. What was it like walking your event? Like, what was the the, the ambiance like? Bliss was talking to, like, some of the, like, um, a couple of dealers that, you know, that did it was Brit, was uh, my buddy Tom from Object Americana, from Ben from Strange the Dot. Some of these really, like, great dealers coming to me and being like, dude, I had a great show. Like, this was fucking awesome. And these were, like, homies that, like, 
That's what you makes know, I wanted an event is just people. Yeah, I wanted to impress them. You know what I mean? In a, in a weird saying, way, where, good and buyers saying, "Yo, I got this piece. I've been looking for this everywhere." It's my exactly home for that right there too. And then homies like um, you know, I'll put him on blast because I love him. Is Alan Heyman coming from New York? And you know, he's a dude that loves the dope pieces and being like, "Yeah, I got this one and I got that one. And I made this deal." And it's like people need to realize when you go to events, they're literally what you make of them. It has nothing to do, like, my job, like you're saying, Chris, yeah. your job, cheers. Your job is to put the dopest dealers or the, a great DJ or whatever you're doing in a room, and then it's up to everybody else to try to enjoy themselves and have fun. If you go in it, like, I'm not going to find anything, and oh, it's overpriced, and I can't believe they're charging $15 to get into the show. It's like... It's like, bro, that's just the, the money so I can pay the fucking the, the venue. You know, yeah, that, that's, not, just the, that, that's literally for the vibe of being in a cool spot and you know, having all the yeah. instead of just some damn parking lot. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, exactly. It's it's like these vendors are gonna come out to a parking lot. They're gonna come out to you know this sick ass event to this sick space that we have. We did it in a fifteen thousand square foot converted industrial building. The, it's called the Waterfire Center that had an actual art gallery that fucking thank we love you at Waterfire. Let us for an entire month do an exhibit that that showcased the evolution of the graphic T-shirt from when it fucking started to 2000. That's sick. You know they didn't have to do that. They have people like saving the world. Like some dude after us was like like a. Um, some dude on like uh water bottles like and how it's detrimental you know what i mean they have like real science and artists in here they were like you four idiots we like what you do you know we like you we'll let you put the t-shirts in the in the thing but so for us it was like we worked really hard to make this an exhibit that like you want to walk in like you'd walk in to see picasso uh and shit and like the coolest part is too is like that was m even more of an attraction i think than the uh, than the dealers, which is crazy to me because we had some of the some great ones, but it was like that. You know, I was like, you know, it felt it felt good to be like I put eight months of my life into this and like lost sleep over it, and people are enjoying themselves. Damn it! You know that was really the cool. Is hitting even harder right now. Fuck! I'm definitely not missing next year. No, you, Chris. I can get first of all. Yeah, the party birthday. alone. It was wifey's birthday next year. I'm like, babe. No, I feel I it. Man. Was. Shout out, Drina. She, the women of this world do so much, you know, do a ton. The fact that they put up with our shit for this long, but well, you'll definitely be at the last one. We're gonna, I mean, the next one. We're gonna have a, uh, we'll have fun. It's up, guys. You got to keep in mind the after party. You know what I mean? Like that's where the fucking dreams are made. So you know, <laughs> it's a, it's a good, uh, it's a good time. I love yeah. it. I love it. All right. So there's chaos, bliss, and then help me name this third part. What was it like after? What's that feeling? when everybody's left and a lot of re a lot of relief but honestly like more not even just relief it was kind of like uh sadness i guess as weird as that sounds of like fuck like i want to do this again tomorrow you know like i, I need to wait a whole fucking year for this and that's how the hotel trading pits were born no no i no, that's not true because we were doing trade pit like People get there two days before virtual at the hotel, and it's just trade pits in the lobby two days before. So it's uh, the virtual is just like an unruly mob in that sense. It's they're just like plopping down shirts all over the city. Well, the trade pit like was where the gnarliest part about the trade pit too, Chris, is it's like the most valuable tees are on the fucking floor. So for me, I'm like, what? Like you know what I mean? That's when I first saw, it, but then too. It shouldn't do because who the fuck knows what the crazy tea that you have hanging on your rack was. I'll tell you this. It'll take two seconds. So you I bought a Tom be in the community to understand that and be okay with that. Yeah. I was never bothered. I bought it. The moment I saw it, I bought it. Like, it I bought a, a dope Tom of Finland shirt from this, this gay dude that um, was, you know, living in New York during the eighties. Like he had all, all this amazing, you know, crazy culture happen to him. So buy the t-shirt from him and he goes bro wash that fucking thing because you have no idea what happened in that you know what probably happened in that thing because like you know you're talking about you know you're talking about that cult that community and culture during fucking 
the eighties in New York. It's nuts. But what I'm saying is like, <laughs> even you homies that have your rap tee hanging on the floor, like some dude might have fucking jacked off into that fu- <laughs> into that fucking <laughs> thing before I got to you, G. So, so just, you know, wash the fucking thing, you know, but you know what I mean? Like there's no, it's vintage. It's all, it's, it's not, we don't know the lineage of the trajectory. It didn't come from some factory, some factory with 10,000 other t-shirts. It came from a, another person yeah. that bought it back in the day. You yeah, know, but I, I know that feeling, man, when the event ends and you're just like, damn, I want to want to do this again. You know, this was too fun. Yeah, it really it was it was amazing. But then you know what though, Chris, for me, it makes me really appreciate waiting for it. Mm-hmm. You know, like remember, waiting for it. Yeah, I remember uh the first event that we had, the first bird tour in Orlando. Kurt came up to me as it was started and we opened the doors came up to me, put his hands on my shoulders like this, and he said, Chris, today is your day. Be proud of this day. We worked very hard for this day. It's going to go by in the blink of an eye. So take time today to stop and look around every chance you get and just really enjoy this moment because it's going to be over before you know it. Just I love really that. make but- memories today. Bro, like, and you know, he's a very crazy, advice. always joking guy. And for him to, like, stop me like that and, like, be serious with me, you know, he does events all the time. I was just like, all right. And sure enough, that's what I did, man. Every once in a while, I would just stop and just look around and just look at people shopping and just, like, look at all the joy in the room and just be like, all right, recorded that, boom, downloaded. Yeah. You know, it was, it was the, great. It was great. Yeah. He's, he's a really cool, cool guy. And you were really fortunate enough, too, that, like, as I was with Long, who's one of who's like our Kirk essentially is like this dude's been putting on events forever and he knows what it takes to do it. And uh so he's he was like that is like, listen, this is what's gonna go down. Like just be prepared to pivot or do what you gotta do. Like that, you know, it might not go exactly how you hoped, but appreciate it. And it was the same result too, where this, you know, I, it was a perfect storm similar to how you guys were, where like you joined up with a dude who um, was your perfect compliment. Like you were like this dude that was really ingrained in the scene. He was this great promoter and you complimented each other really well. And the rest was history. Yeah, man. The, rest, yeah. the rest is history. We'll name it right here. So before it, that's the, uh, chaos. Then we got bliss when, when the, when it's happening, it's just a dance, all the chaos, whether you're ready for the day, something may have not made it, whatever. It's still a blast. And then the last part, exactly. we call it a, uh, We'll, we'll, we'll do a chapter. Relief. Like, really the adjective right now, but I'm thinking bittersweet. Bittersweet, relief, whatever. Weight lifted. I don't know. We'll <laughs> make up a, we'll, we'll think of one, but yeah. And, but then it was all honestly like fate. It happens. We partied. It was Sunday, Monday morning. I called Sam and I was like, when are we doing this again? You know, it didn't, it didn't turn it. It wasn't like uh we're the coolest. We put on a really cool fucking event. It was like, no, like that event was amazing. And I was so thankful for it, but how do we make it better? Mm-hmm. How do we have, how do we make the dealers more money? How do we make the, uh, the people coming to the show enjoy themselves even more? Well, like, what it's not, have you come up with if you don't, if you don't mind sharing? We have two really dope artists that we're talking to that I like, can't believe, uh, you know, I'm even in the same conversation with them. Uh, I'm not going to say their names. I'll say San Francisco and Texas. Those are the two things I'm going to let you know. I'll, you, I'll, those are your two clues uh, for this. But um, San Francisco and Texas, um, we have that going on. We're also um, we're working to we're working on the new concept, which we have a couple floating around, and I don't want to blow it before it comes to realization. But uh, the weekend that this show is going to take place is essentially going to be like a vintage Lollapalooza. Like if you guys are going to Faded, you're really going to want to come in on Friday and you're not going to want to leave the New England area till like when, like Wednesday night. Plan on a week because it's going to be, you know, without giving the, the date away, it's going to be within a string of things happening that are all going to be uh, like, it's going to make it worth it for you to come for an entire week of the, of the show. So, I believe um, as far as you say, yeah. yes, 
and some other concepts because already the first one had some crazy concepts to it that paid off, made the experience more fun. And then as far as guests go, you guys had amazing artists and uh, people behind the things that we love, which enhanced the experience. And if you're, if with one of the cities that you said, if it's who I think it is, who's kind of in that realm of like behind some of the t-shirts that we love, I'm hyped for that, man. Yeah. Ah, it's context too for me, Chris. Like the whole idea of faded is to give people context of like, this is a t-shirt, you know, it just, it looks cool. It's, it has a nice fade, but why is it like, why should anybody care and pay X amount of dollars for it? It's because that artist that is now, we're lucky enough that he's sitting at a panel or a desk willing to talk about his journey for the last 40, like the fact that Taggart, Sean Taggart, who I admire and is in one of my favorite documentaries of all time, not only invites me to his studio, but like calls me from time to time to talk about art. It's like, how the fuck did a schmuck like me, you know what I mean? Like get this type of opportunity. And I feel, you know, I'm not a religious man, Chris, but I will say blessed in that sense of like, um, you know, you just feel like, how the fuck did we get here? Like this, like I was stoked when you call when you, when you, when you, DM me to do this. I uh, was telling Chloe, I'm like, yo, I haven't talked to Chris in a while. He wants me to do the fucking show. You know, this, you know, this is crazy. Like, I don't, they want to you're listen to what I have to say. You're my dog. <laughs> I always love to talk in love with you anytime we're on live or when we do coffee with Jay's. I love your yeah. energy, man. And uh, We'll get you out show. here. We'll show you this flavor. For sure, man. For this podcast, I just want to talk to people that I like talking to. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, that's kind that's of the important. This, it's like I said earlier, my style is practical. So here for the podcast, just kind of the same approach. Like just who are some chill dudes that love what I love that I'd like to sit down and talk with for an hour and a half. Well, hours. that's how you love it. And that's how Coffee and Jay's like to end on this one. That's how Coffee and Jay's, we we learned, We even though we were working a lot and hard at it, we loved it because, dude, I was meeting people like I had, the most memorable one for me was Chris from Bridge Nine, who not a lot of people know anything about hardcore in here, but Bridge Nine was this hardcore label in Boston that like shaped my youth. And I'm literally sitting there talking to the fucking guy, like, you know, being like at my level, you know, he's, we're at the same level of like, of intellectual thought and thinking right at that moment. And I'm like, how the fuck did I, like, I couldn't even get in the same room with this guy back when I was a teenager. Now he wants to fucking come on the show, you know? So we're lucky, man. I'm telling you. That's right. All right, let's get to some fun questions here. Uh, best piece in your right. collection right now? Um, the piece I'm the most stoked about uh, actually came from an, uh, a dude overseas. I can't promise it'll be in there forever, but... Um, Keith Haring in 1986 put out a really awesome design. This is before the pop shop sh uh, shop existed of it's two dudes in pink jacking each other off like cartoon dudes. Uh, the safe, And it says safe sex. That's probably my favorite. That's a shirt that I've, I missed at um, ThriftCon year, uh, a year ago. And I finally, you know, have it in my collection. So. That was, was crazy. That's my... uh, Ari, last year's Garments 80s, just posted it. I just liked it today. That's that's the one. That's the one I own. That is. I bought, I bought that. I bought it off of him. Yeah. Oh, you got, you he's got a, that he's one. A red. I oh. got the exact one. That, that's the overseas. That, without, you know, <laughs> yeah. big Ari, what's up, buddy? You know, thanks for the tea. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah we I did a deal. That's your, your guy. We can edit that out. <laughs> oh, no. Don't edit that shit out. No. I'm, dude, that's the other thing, too, is I love giving. Uh, especially overseas where I love the vintage is now global. I love giving the overseas guys who have been fucking killing it. Killing you know, it. With their lives. Killing it with their lives. So know, what so do you think that's, that's about? Why, why are the overseas guys, their lives are popping off the roof. Uh, and then like, dude, I was watching a reel the other day of some dudes in Thailand busting open bales and pulling out Pink Floyd tees and rap tees. And bro, the plays on those reels are in the millions like that to me, mm -hmm. what it implies for just vintage in general and sellers in the vintage community and the popularity of vintage is I, I, when have we ever had something hit millions? I mean, probably round two show, but even then, yeah. like vintage was kind of just like a supporting actor role in the streetwear movie. 
Oh, yeah, for sure. Now, yeah. for uh-huh. real about pulling shirts out of a bale to hit millions of views, what are the implications of that for vintage? Literally, I don't, I couldn't tell. I don't, I think they just got lucky with, uh, as Americans, we're so stupid and we passed on some of the gnarliest shit that ended up over there. Yeah, but that's my only, um, that's my only reasoning towards it. And I think that they, you know, I think that they're more, pa- they're not that we're not passionate, but they still find a love in it that like we, we're so flavor of the week as American Americans where it's like, oh, it's not cool anymore. It's got to go. You know, and also I'm, like, I'm bored. The, like a, a shirt going for $100 here means more to them over there for like $100 here means more. Oh, the currency thing too. More, yeah, the currency help. exchange. Yeah. So a hundred dollars over there is way more money. Yeah. Right. You know? And it's dope. And I, I love nothing makes me feel better than, you know, some of these dudes are, this is their full-time job too. This is what they do. They're full-time vintage guys. So I like to support, I'll be honest with you too, Chris, I, I do not buy stuff. Of, you got a lot of wildly rich people over there too, that their introduction to vintage isn't like, you know, some private stylist, like maybe here, I hear I'm, I'm kind of riffing now. But here, maybe a celebrity Riff, baby. person gets styled, and that's how they get introduced to vintage. Over there, mm-hmm. they're just like, they're just seeing these lives, and they're just buying straight from the lives. There was literally like a dude that he's a straight up actor in Thailand, or I forgot where it was. Uh, he came in the live and was buying shit on auction, and people were like, yo, he's like Tom Cruise in our country. I was like, holy shit. That's so dope, dude. That is so dope. So you crazy. got and- big numbers going off on the lives. Like it's a whole sensation over there. Yeah, I have a, I had a dude uh, last week that was ultra ultra stoked on a shirt that I unfortunately sold, and it was just so crazy that I was like, I grew up listening to this fucking dude when I was a kid, uh, and idolized him, and now he wants a, a piece of clothing that I owned, and you know, was pissed he missed it, and I'm like. Vintage dude is like it's it's so it's a, this enigma still, Chris. It's a really weird, crazy thing. But yeah, that I safe think, sex like, shirt. People, is, I think people saw what happened during the pandemic and all the craziness and prices and all that stuff, and thought that that was like the height of it. And but I still feel like it's still very young, still a young community, super young. Nowhere my brother a mainstream thing. Yeah, my brother's like a, I consider a hip dude that pays attention to stuff. He still doesn't, he's not convinced. So it's like, don't, when you guys think, when everyone thinks it's dead, realize that there is like, we're like a, a percentage of like 0.035% of the entire world that understands what this shit is. So I saw a rival the other day. It said, uh, it was like uh, Christian Bale from American Psycho saying like, it's like a scene from the movie. And he goes, it's because I wanted to fit in. And like the exactly. the, the quote above the the reel was um, uh, why did you wear a shirt with holes in it? And I was like, I was like, I was like, oh, vintage people wear it now to fit in. I remember when that was like the outcast thing to wear. But I, oh, yeah. I I can't fully agree with that still. Like I think vintage is still not the thing that you wear to fit in. In what circles would that happen? No. Maybe like at at the bins or something, but in I mean, the, the, still very, very much in its infancy. Yeah, the rad part about Rose Bowl and Brimfield being two events, though, is like you really Brimfield see. Brimfield is like the Rose Bowl of. It's like the Rose Bowl, but it's so much more grassroots where it's literally like it's like a fucking dude from Indiana who has all his dope denim will drive his fucking tractor out to. Uh, you know, to these fields and do when I tell you there is at least a thousand vendors, if not more at, at Brimfield over a, a seven day span, that's like going light on it. You know, I just heard of Brimfield this year. So how often is it? Cause it's not monthly, right? No, it's, uh, it's three times a year for a week. Wow. A week. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's a week of, and, and October 1st, guys. All the things you need to know will be revealed October 1st, and, you know, we'll, we'll see it. But, yeah. Um, Man, this sounds Chris, easy, I actually, All right, we're going to play a game called What Would You Offer Me? So I'm going to show you a okay. shirt, and then you tell me what you would offer me for this shirt, and then I'm going to show this shirt again, 
to my next guest, and we're going to see the contrast in what I like that. they would offer and why they would offer. It's going to be. This is really going to expose me right now. This is. I love this. That's good. <laughs> Here we go. So I just picked this up today. I think it might even become a personal for me, but it's a uh, size XL. All right. So you, your store, I walk in. Um, is this something that you're going to resell or are you going to keep? And then let me know how much you would offer. So size XL, M&M, T, nicely faded. It's got the lightning on it that I've never, this one I've never seen before. And then it's got the M&M hit on the back. Size XL. I love the back. I love the back. The fade yeah. looks killer. All right. I would say that I would at least keep that for a little while because that's one of the rappers when I was a kid that, I was definitely, st I'm not a huge rap guy, but I'm stoked on Eminem. I would want to get 550 out of it. So I'd probably shy, I'd, I'd give you 100, 200 bucks for that. Two, 250. He said 100 at first. I like that profit margin though. <laughs> yeah, double my money. I mean, I got to run a business here, Chris. This ain't, you know. I feel you. <laughs> but man. yeah, no, that would probably. 200. All right. I mean, it, I mean, it's on an unknown tag, you know. Uh, yeah, sure. I, you know, I need the money. Boom, 200. There you go. Boom. All right. Right. It's right. Be yeah. no, exactly. what, it'll be interesting to hear what the next uh, guest that I have on says. Yeah, because I, I don't have a lot of perspective on those type of shirts, but I do know that um, just subject matter alone, dude, who the fuck doesn't know who Eminem is? At, at the, my dad knows who Eminem is, you know? Yeah. So he's definitely a popular dude. But. All right. And this one, I was going to let you go, but I got one that I have to ask. Top yeah. five shows you would see the artist that, that if you could go back in time or – uh, yeah, yeah, Dead or Alive, top five concerts you would love to go back to go watch. All right. Um, all right, ready? I would love to see um, number one. Um, I would love to see um, the Talking Heads and the filming of the Stop Making Sense documentary. Like, if I could be there for that, for that performance. Um, I, I think David Byrne is probably one of the most creative and influential people, uh, personally that I think in my, in the world. So, um, that would be number one. Um, the Ramones, it's their first performance at CBGB's to see them probably fight with each other and fucking ha hate it. You know what I mean? Like, cause those dudes are like notorious for being fuck up. So, um, that, um, there's a really iconic performance of Iggy Pop getting held up. Uh, it was a screensaver on my phone for a long time, held up um, with like no shirt on. Uh, it was, I think, towards the middle of the Stooges' small run that they were a band at the beginning. That one. Um, Kanye West during his... I didn't get to see it, but the fucking tour with the platform where that went above the stage. Do you know that? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? I didn't get my boy went to that and said it was like incredible. Um, and then last, last was a show that I was at. So I mean, this was I'll never forget the show. There's a Ooh, rock and roll band. Yep. Yeah, there's a rock and roll band called Brand New that um uh, the a couple months before they broke up, I got to see them at the Wang Theater in Boston, and it was a fucking one of the best shows of all time that I've seen because they meant so much to me as a as a kid. So those are definitely the five five shows I think. That is a high wish top I, five because my top five was just like the artists because of their impact, but like you went yeah. and said like for a reason, like Talking Heads. I'm a nerd. I'm a nerd, and I've spent no, way too it. much time. Research. I want to be a rock historian, Chris. I still think there's a place for me somewhere, but uh, you know, I I love that. I love that shit. So. Wonder you love yeah. these things, man. They got lots of history. Yo, uh, Joe, thanks so much for coming on, man. Good chopping up with you. We will definitely have to do a Amazing. part two because we didn't even get to this week's cool. topics. I started CrossFit. Uh, taking my, I took my son to preschool this week. Dude, I heard the haircut was gnarly. I'm sure you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, man, but uh, we'll catch up on the next one, man. Joe, thanks so much for taking the time to come on and chop it up with me. You guys, go follow my guy, Joe, Champagne Room with Sinatra. Get ready for the next Faded event. Am I missing anything? That's it, baby. Guys, just check the uh, – follow the Instagram if you want to – if you care about what I do. If not, I totally get it. There's so many great dealers. Follow some of them. But, yeah. You go. That's Much it. Love, man. Thanks for coming on. We all care. We definitely care. <laughs> so good to see you, brother. For sure, man. Peace.
Thank you.